Hey everyone and welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast where we seek to develop, inspire and motivate the world of the emergency services operator through a series of wide-ranging conversations. Now before we go any further, just hit that rate, follow or subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to. It's a key performance indicator for us and helps us reach even more people. Now here's what we've got for you today. I was really interested in getting you on today because your role as kind of what you do now, leadership coaching, keynote speaking, kind of changing the workforce into this culture of effective leadership and all the positive traits that come with that. Yours is quite a unique one because as we spoke about before we came on, coaching is a bit of the wild west and very few people have the authenticity that you do because you've actually done the thing. I don't know how many people that follow and, and sort of subscribe to the stuff that you go on to actually know that you had a career in this as well. So what I'd love to start with, if we could, is kind of connect the dots for me about your origin story in the first responder community. Yeah, of course, no worries. Well, my life in the fire and rescue service started when I was a a very young, small, slim man at the age of 18 in sunny (laughs) North Devon. And I joined a little fire station here called Coo Martin as a retained firefighter, as it was at the time. Uh, I spent sort of about four years working as a retained firefighter down here uh, and was doing an awful lot of co-responding, so medical response to bits, before I then uh, picked up a role in Avon Fire and Rescue Service in March of 2006 as a whole-time firefighter, which was ultimately the dream. It was the, what I'd always wanted to do. Yeah. So started out in Avon in 2006 then spent a bit of time working on operational fire stations for for quite a few years before I ended up sort of leaving operational life while staying within the fire service and moving into learning and development. And I spent about four years doing that. Uh, came out of there, back onto ops again uh, as a, a watch manager, uh, running a couple of different shifts, and finally ended my fire service career in national operational guidance again as a watch manager and i guess i probably spent about eight years of my life as a watch manager and there was an awful lot of pressure to kind of progress on to station manager or group manager level but it just wasn't for me i just didn't see me doing that role dude that's exactly where i am right now (laughs) is that right (laughs) yeah i'm just yeah interesting i'm literally having that like ah I'm being invited to join a group with the greatest of respect as I travel across the UK. And it's some, it's going to be a lot of what we talk about today. Some of you seem really, a lot of the large percentage of you seem very unhappy. It's like you're trying to invite me into a large pool of feces and convincing me it doesn't smell. And I'm like, but I enjoy what I'm doing. No, jump in. And I'm like, Oh, but it looks like you're not enjoying what you're doing. <laughs> you know, I, I know that's something we're going to come on to different aspects. And that, 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 is that they were very siloed uh, individuals. There's also some great and happy people doing that. But it seems not to be the majority. But sorry, no, I interrupted you. Not at all, Pete, because I've had exactly the same experience. It's bizarre that we're sharing this already. It's uh, I remember a, a group manager taking me to lunch one day. Um, and said, look, you know, I want to try and convince you to go for your station manager. And this must have been about four or five years ago. Mm. And he sat there telling me how good it would be if I took on the role of a station manager. I could come out, do some shifts with him, just to get sort of like a feel and an idea of what it's like. And interestingly, through that lunch break, we'd gone on from talking about how good it would be if I took on this role, uh, flipping it the other way to how sad he was actually feeling at that time in his life and how it was such a stressful role. And he felt like he spent so much of his time trying to deal with issues and problems that existed elsewhere that he was unable to spend too much time looking Dude, after this himself. This is going to sound like bullshit because like, people are going to think we've genuinely structured this before I come. I sat at a country club about three months ago with someone and like you say during the, his relation really fell apart. He looked like he'd had a fucking terminal illness. He looked really poorly. I was genuinely concerned for him. It wasn't actually to meet in about my progression. It was more just like we were just talking because I, I meet with different members of different services at lots of different levels to have these sorts of conversations. It's part of a, a Chinese concept. I always talk to people about. Um, have you heard of Nimu, Nimu, oh, Nimuashi? I think it's called. So Nimuashi is this aspect of essentially conducting change through an organization through lots of cultural fingerprints and touch points think of it like a spider's web where no matter what level of the organization you're at 
you're kind of having conversations informally, usually outside of work, just with different cultural architects at different levels of the organization that hold a similar viewpoint to you. And I was having this conversation with this person doing like informal up, down coaching, you know, sort of across the organization, just despite the fact we're at different levels. And yeah, this person was literally sharing some of the same stuff that this guy was with you in a totally different part of the country, at a totally different period of time. It's bizarre, isn't it? It's just mm. so, so bizarre how like in one hand, someone's trying to convince you to go for this role. And then the next hand, they're saying, no, this is, this is really awful. And this is really affecting my life. It's affecting my work life. It's affecting my home life, so on and so forth. Uh, and it was just, why on earth would I want to put myself in that position? You know, I was quite comfortable as a watch manager. I would go to work. I'd do a job. You know, I felt like I did a, a good job, a pretty good job of what I was doing. And I could go home at the end of the day and I didn't have to worry. And especially when I was working in national guidance in the end, um, because I wasn't on ops anymore. So I had taken all of that emotional stress away from what I was seeing when I was out on the road. And like I said, I did, I did 20 years in the fire service in the end. But yeah, I found myself in a, a far more comfortable position, but it wasn't a challenging position. And that's what I was missing from the fire yeah. service in the end is I was turning up to work. I was doing a job. Uh, well but it wasn't giving me the challenge that I really wanted and I I was looking around for for almost that kind of job enrichment what can I do because I've I've worked in uh, national guidance I've worked on ops I've worked in learning and development there wasn't really much else a watch manager could do to get a sort of like a full rounded picture in the service and that's effectively what led me to the decision to move on and do something that really was a passion of mine which is where i am today uh, and set myself up as a leadership coach uh, and facilitator of workshops and doing the occasional keynotes and trying to get a message out there about changing culture through effective leadership which again was something that i'd experienced in my time in the fire service this episode of the podcast is brought to you by Gore-Tex Professional Fabrics. Now, we all know the working environment of a firefighter is filled with challenges. We face serious risks on the job, such as heat exhaustion, burns, physical and mental stress, and we frequently come into contact with high levels of toxic chemicals. Now, I have been wearing Gore-Tex for nearly two decades on the front line, working in hostile environments, tackling challenging incidents from firefighting to water incidents and in urban search and rescue environments. Gore-Tex have a well-earned reputation for protecting professionals in the fire and emergency services through their family of highly innovative waterproof breathable moisture barriers that exceeds global performance standards and are trusted worldwide Gore-Tex going further together that's a big decision though mate that's a big like because I feel that uncomfortable like I'm sitting on a nail like I've got a stone in my shoe you know, I, I've always said to people, I rarely stay in jobs for longer than about two years, 18 months max, really, because I get bored. I just get really bored. You know, I get to about 80 percent, 90 percent of being good at the thing because people will say, all right, now I'm going to spend the next two years or the next 10 years becoming an expert. But I always say to people, and I'm not trying to encourage every firefighter to go for promotion or anything like that, but you can't complete firefighting. Do you know what I mean? It's not a level that you can complete. You can't complete sub-officer, crew manager, LF. You can't complete the rank. Do you know what I mean? There'll always be the job you never went to, the yeah. investigation you were never part of, the whatever. Do you know what I mean? You can spend 30 years on a technical rescue station and never have that job that James had with the horse hanging off the bridge Then you had to put a line access system in. You know, you, you're just never going to have it. Do you know what I mean? So past a certain point, you yeah. have to go is the return on investment still worth it? Do you know what I mean? Um, is the juice worth the squeeze to continue to do everything? Because like, I think of it like um, training in a gym. Training in a gym, the first couple of years, you get massive gains. Do you know what I mean? It's like you, your strength, your conditioning, your motivation, your mindset, these things leap forward. They, they go forward in like strides, don't they? And then after you've been in it, I mean, I've been training for... Yeah. 20 years or something stupid i'm lucky if i get a one percent improvement on anything in a six month period you know, not because i'm a freaking amazing athlete because i've done a lot of damage to my body but also like you've just done so much of the stuff you know and it's like 
you get to a point where you want to do something different. That's why I've had to change what I do physically. But like getting back to that career aspect, you did the retain the whole time, the L&D, the ops, the non-ops, the NOG. You know, I'm the same. I've done the fire investigation, the ops assurance, the ISAR, the USAR, the on-call, the, you know, the crew, the watch, the operational watch. I mean, T and training and development, learning and development now. And I'm like, uh, and that's why I'm looking over the fence at the next bit because something's got to, I've, it has, I have to feel like, it's like my body's getting ready to jump off a cliff and it's like, which way do you want to go? Decide which way do you want to go? Because it's soon, I'm just going to jump into the void at some point because I'm feeling that itch. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like the stone in your shoe is growing so much. Yeah. You know what I mean? What what what, what did you see? Because I mean, some of the, com- well, a lot of the conversation we have today is around leadership. Maybe I just wanted to pause there for a second and ask, from your on-call times, then moving into whole time, transitioning into that delivery role, that 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 self-awareness from a from a teacher, from an instructor. Talk to me about your first impressions before you've done all of this training, you know, because perception is also reality. Even if someone hasn't done some of the formal professional courses that you've done, in that infancy mindset, we knew what good and bad leadership, guidance. Even colleagues, even champions on the watch, we knew what that felt like then, even if we didn't know how to articulate it. So looking back then, what were your first few years coming in? What do you think good leadership was like then? Well, that's a really interesting question. And I I think when I take myself back to before I joined the fire service and looked at my perspective of what being a firefighter was like, it was very much based on what I saw on the TV with London's burning. And I, I very much thought, you know, that is exactly what the fire service must be like. You know, there was this whole kind of like hero side to it, helping people, pulling people out of fires all the time. Um, and I just thought, you know what, that looks really, that looks interesting. <laughs> Have you seen Backdraft? I watched that again recently. Yeah. <laughs> I think they talk about oh, yes. that arsonist. He's like, <laughs> did, did you look into the eye of the fire? Did the fire see you? And you're like, fucking hell, mate, steady. It's not, you know, that's not really what it's like. No. It's a bit weird. But yeah, that's that's the reality. It, that's the perception, sorry, of the public. That That is, yeah. And if you want to get really kind of scientific, and I'm sure if you spoke to some um, fire fire behavior experts on it they'll tell you the name backdraft was completely inappropriate for that film and it yes it it should have been called something else you know but uh, (laughs) but um but yeah my perception of the fire service was very different to reality Uh, and i can remember first day on training school here in uh, north devon when i was joining the retained uh, and it was it was quite militaristic and i actually joined a very awkward time i joined very early 2003 and there had just been the strikes that had taken place in twenty, yeah. oh, sorry, two thousand and two. So there was there was a really weird vibe between whole time and on call at the time. And I know strikes are quite an emotive subject to talk yeah. about, but I came in right after that that strike that had happened. So again, the 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 whole kind of experience was very different. It was quite militaristic at the time. It was very much you know you will do this and you went off and you did your training and there was a lot of us versus them as well wasn't there there was a lot of some people really had problems there was there was some bit yeah there was it was a bit and it got in the way of the job a little bit it did it did and and like you know that's that's something that does come up you know when when we get on to talking about culture a bit later that there is an element an underlying element of that that still kind of pre-exists in the service but Again, that's that's kind of going slightly off track with 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 this, but it was an awkward time, but I really enjoyed it. And I liked the discipline at that time in my life. I mean, being 18, um, very, very kind of new to adulthood. I needed structure, I needed discipline. I'd had that at school growing mm. up, was you know, I was told where I was gonna be, what I was gonna do. So it kind of worked for me in that respect and it pushed me hard and I did learn quite a lot while I was doing it so that was what it was like so my first impression of leadership when I first came in was very much of an autocratic style of leadership if you will do this you will do that so that's kind of what I resounded myself for it to be like however when I moved on to my my uh, retained fire station here in lovely little Kumartin I don't mind naming it because I had such a great experience there it was very different. It was very relaxed. I think that there was more of a laissez-faire style of leadership on the station at the time as well. Very supportive of each other. And there was a really great culture and team dynamic. It just felt like I I joined a group of friends, really, and I just blended in really nicely. We did 
lots of things together at the station, lots of things outside of work together. And there was a real community spirit around that station. So my that 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 side of leadership was really, really good. Then I moved up to Avon and into whole time. So again, when I went on to training school, still had that element of a militaristic style. It wasn't quite as extreme as military, but it was there was still that element there going through training school, which again, I didn't mind, quite enjoyed it. And I almost felt like slightly ahead of the curve, having done a few years retained experience coming into there. Yeah. So I was able to almost act as a little bit of a mentor at times to other people uh, through through training school. Uh, and then on to my first station. And uh, I remember my first sub-officer very well. He's now the assistant chief fire officer of a fire service. Yeah. Um, again, he was very supportive when I was there, but he was only my sub for about a year. And then I ended up getting a sub-officer called John Rides. And I again, I will happily name John because John is up there with one of the best leaders that I have ever had in my time in the fire service. Can't stand the bloke. Hate him. But no, I'm joking. I don't even know him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you would be hard pressed, I think, to find anyone that yeah. dislikes John. I know people like that. When some people say, like, "Oh, I, f- I fell out with James," and I'm like, "How did you fall out with James?" You know what I mean? Some people when they say, "Oh, you know, I, I hate John," and you're like, "John, the same John. How have you fallen out with John? The guy is yeah. so self-aware. He's so good at building rapport. He's a good listener." You're like. If, when someone says that, you're like, mm, I'm struggling here. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Exactly what you mean. Because it comes up all the time. But, but I think that's okay, though. Every now and then, it is okay to have a difference of opinion with someone about your views and opinions on someone, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but yeah, John was great. Did you feel those initial first differences then? Because I think, and I want to just circle back to that mm. on-call retain period, because I think some of those, and even you see this mm-hmm. in volunteer organizations, like uh, I work with the company React. Do you know who they are? They do a lot of the um, international yes. rescue yeah. stuff. Leadership in organizations that's either volunteered or very low paid, like retained. Because the retained, you know, if you were just an autocratic dictator, people would be like, you know what, I haven't got a beer. Why have you been a dick? Do you know what I mean? There'd be an aspect of that involved. There's also sometimes a lot more passion, I think, in retained and on-call sectors. No, they don't take that as a hint to the whole time, or the, to the whole time, because I'm whole time. But it's like people are there because they really want to be there. Sometimes they have a much stronger why, and the leadership abilities. Because a lot of these individuals, as well, and you'll know this far better than me, they usually run a, a successful organization outside of it. You know, some of these people might run their own business locally. It tends to be the people that get attracted to the on-call because they're like. They're already a leader in their own right in their business, and then they want to do a little bit community-based work as well. So as a snapshot at that period of time, and I know obviously you say you had John, who was a great leader, but how did you see the initial differences from the leadership styles on the on-call and whether or not that still enabled a high-performing culture versus what you then saw in the whole time aspect? Yeah, well, I mean, going back to to the on-call People cared, you know, and I'm not saying that whole time don't care. I'm far from it because, you know, people care in both. But like like you also highlighted there, you, you feel like there's a stronger sense of why for why people do this. And I remember when I joined on call and I was asked the question of why do you want to do this? And it was very much that I wanted to help people. And that has never changed. And that still stands with me today, even though I don't currently work in the fire service. Hmm. But when it comes to on call people that there isn't really the financial incentive to be there. There needs to be a deeper sense of why people want to be there, like you said. So what I would experience there, and I'm sure it would still be the same today if I was still working on the station, was that real sense of camaraderie, community, and wanting to help others above all else. And I know that, um, and and I experienced on call both in Devon as well as in Avon when I was working there as well that um, when it comes to all of the higher level political agendas that are going on within organisations, there isn't really that desire or want to try and get to understand it too deeply because that's not why they're there. They're not there for the, the top senior positions and understanding what is going on. They are there because they want to help people and they want to help members of their community. And the, the other thing that we need to remember is these people helping people, they generally know. So every time the, the you know, the, uh, the bells go down, 
they are often responding to a road down the road that might be one of their neighbors could be a friend could be a family member and i i certainly experienced that myself that it was family members that i was um that i i dealt with on on occasions and and friends so it is very very closely linked to your community and there's a huge community spirit with the retained or on call as it's now known i think that's so very true and you do get this sort of identity in the community and that's why some people do it and that's sometimes not a great thing but you Mm. do have this i'm responsible for making this thing better for the people that live around me i've got an i've got a vested interest in these businesses remaining safe in the you know the community especially somewhere like that you know is a very uh tourist driven community as well i want this to be a safe place i want people to be attracted to come in here i want people to want to live here and stay here i want them to feel safe do you know what I mean? And that's really something that you take a personal responsibility yeah. for because people identify you as a firefighter in the community, whether you're taking your kids to the shop or you're sitting on a big red truck. Do you know what I mean? They identify you in 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 that sort of capacity as well. So take me then on to that aspect of moving into the instructor and deliverer because a lot of what you do now is a, is a very competent speaker and coach and you speak to large groups of individuals sometimes or most often at senior leadership levels as well what's the correlation in the tools that you picked up because this is something i think we're really terrible at in the in the first responder community we don't actually teach people how to articulate themselves we don't teach them public speaking but actually we get them to go and do public talks on a regular basis how did you sort of develop that self awareness develop those uh, leadership traits and that ability to deliver because you did obviously like you said spend some time in learning and development as well yeah no absolutely so yeah when, when i move on to learning and development i went into that role as a watch manager as part of a promotion and i think i'd, I'd had some experience of delivering training uh, and talking to groups of people beforehand albeit it was within the fire and rescue service or even when i was out delivering talks to schools as, as a firefighter um and it was something that I really enjoyed. I do, I've always enjoyed speaking to other people and telling a story or passing on some kind of information, wisdom, whatever it might be, even just talking to people to learn from them and get some something back from their experiences. So what did I do, though, in those moments to try and elevate my skill set? Well, I mean, I was in L&D for four years, and year one was very much try and understand the different courses that they were delivering. So we had uh, courses on BA, tactical ventilation, RTC, um, safe work and height, so on and so forth. And I didn't know the the content of all of those. So I ended up having to effectively be a bit of a uh, a jack of all trades and and learn everything. And then they put you out there and they said, right, we're going to get you to deliver. So you start delivering. And it was interesting because I can remember delivering things in a way that felt... Like it was something that I could understand. If I was to deliver it in this way and I was able to simplify it, I would understand it. However, that might not have been the way that someone else wanted to do it. And I can remember on several occasions being told, that's not how we deliver this presentation. We deliver it like this. And it was, it wasn't right. It wasn't authentic. So I was almost trying to be someone different every time I presented something. And it never worked. And I lost my true authentic self when it came to doing this, you know, traditional style of delivery. Um, But after year one, year two, I started to become a little bit more competent and confident in what I was delivering. And I was able to kind of stand up for myself and go, no, actually, I'm going to do it this way because the feedback we're getting is really good. You know, have a little look at it. And, And that's a key point there is feedback and getting feedback from other people. Now, it's it's good to have a bit of self-awareness but when you're getting feedback from others you're getting almost like their appraisal of how that session has gone and it is so important that when we do look for feedback we look for genuine and honest feedback and I tended to find that the best feedback that I ever got was always the indirect feedback it was when someone said oh such and such was on that training course with you yesterday and they said that you were really good and excellent blah 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 that's honest feedback isn't it so what you get at the yeah. form at the end of the day that's pretty good feedback but that's not the genuine feedback always not always anyway mm. so feedback's key the other thing that i would add in that i did around that time uh, and this was certainly around self-development 
And when I talk about self-development, this is about me developing myself so I can develop others. So I kind of, self-development should be for others' gain as well as your own. I was reading an awful lot of books um, and I, I really got into TED Talks as well. So I don't yeah. know if anyone uh, watches TED Talks, but you have effectively got people well and truly at the top of their game that are presenting their message to other people. And it is fascinating to watch how they present. So this is what I would do is I'd end up watching TED Talks. And to begin with, I was absorbing the information they were giving. And that shifted. And I went from absorbing the information to watching their delivery style. Mm. And that was where I really started to learn about how I could present better to other people. And don't get me wrong, I know that I'm far from being a perfect presenter now, but I will continue to learn as time moves on. And that's the other key is to make sure that you don't get complacent in what you're doing and always look for feedback. Uh, and whatever feedback comes, just be really grateful for it. You might not agree with it, but be grateful for what comes back. Um, Mate, I know I'm so going yeah, to put you I on guess, the spot here, but kind like, of... did you have any favourite? Go on. Because <laughs> I, I, I totally agree with you. Like I always say to people, work twice as hard on yourself as you do on the job. And people struggle with personal development yeah. sometimes because they think it needs to be structured yeah. for them. It needs to be tailored, as in like by somebody else. It needs to be prescribed, like medication. But for me, it's like, yeah. just start. I mean, don't just do it always. Just go out there and look around in the forest. People that are genuine practiced experts in this thing, you know, you watch, irrespective of their political leans or anything like that. If you want to look at public speak, go look at Barack Obama. You know, go look at these incredible orators. H Hitler, for God's sake. You know, look at different versions of great speakers. One of my favorite ones is... um. Julian Treasure is a guy that does how to speak yep. so that people want to listen is one of his TED Talks I'd suggest people go to. And in fact, I'll try and pull a link so we can add it to the notes for this podcast. But he talks about that beautiful yep. instrument that is your voice. Do you know what I mean? And play with it. And, and, and I'm totally honest with people. Like, I do this now. I did a, a warm-up for this podcast. Okay? I did a voice warm-up for this podcast yeah finding the range do it roll in the r's you know pop pop in the mat all of these things to flex and stretch my mouth because this is my instrument i am the filter through which this thing if you're in training and development learning development whatever you're the filter through which this thing is going to travel just like you just said james it's like pete don't just stand there and read the goddamn powerpoint okay any freaking idiot can do that that is just going to die on its feet okay You've got to sacrifice yourself at the altar of delivery. Yeah. You, whether you've got to be funny, passionate, you know, whatever it might be to get that thing across. Do, do you have any other sort of favorites? I mean, some of the stuff that you see in the film, The King's Speech is great as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you said Julian Treasure there. And it's funny, I, I knew this question was going to come. And I already <laughs> had Julian Treasure in my mind as well. I, I know exactly the TED talk that you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Uh, he even talks about his mum being very negative in her later years towards the end, yeah, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. Um, so because he, he uh, says he goes one. something like, um, oh, it's October 27th today, mum. And she goes, yeah, what a shame. Isn't it dreadful? <laughs> yeah, dreadful, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. One, uh, who is yeah, the two Andes? who do that book oh they, they've got a book the two andes it's something like in fact i've no, got when it you said two, when you said two andes i just thought of hot fuzz you bought hot fuzz didn't you because the guys uh, it's battle. <laughs> the CID. i absolutely love that one as well um, oh who's the two guys um yeah they do a talk i'm gonna have a quick look now i'm gonna i'm just scrolling down my audio book Today's podcast is powered by our partner Lifelines and their revolutionary approach to functional hydration. Just like in firefighting, water is essential for body function, but studies show more than 80% of firefighters are dehydrated. A 25-year study findings from the National Institute of Health showed poor hydration to be linked to early aging and chronic disease and even mild dehydration results in significant negative impact outcomes including headaches, exhaustion, rapid pulse, irritability and poor cognitive function. 
A study conducted by Yale University showed that participants who were just 1% dehydrated had a 12% increase in errors when performing tasks that required cognitive flexibility. In addition, dehydration is shown to worsen mood and attitude, contribute to confusion and poor decision making, and negatively affect memory and judgment. In other words, you really don't want your incident commander, firefighter, or for that matter any first responder on a critical scene to be even slightly dehydrated. Mild dehydration occurs when a person is just 1.5% dehydrated, a condition that does not even trigger the first response in most people so just imagine how quickly a firefighter or any first responder can and does become dehydrated in their day-to-day -day duties which is why i address my hydration first thing every day with lifelines go into the notes for this episode and specifically check out lifelines hydro fuel and hydro og by clicking in the notes for the podcast for a clean energy solution designed for those who demand more from their day now back to the show one for me would be sir ken robinson Oh, and the yes. thing that I liked about Sir Ken Robinson, he didn't use PowerPoint. He didn't move around the stage. He wasn't animated, but he was extremely engaging and quite humorous with what he did. And I think that there was this really lovely, subtle tone of humor that he used within the way that he spoke that got engagement. And there was another thing that Sir Ken Robinson does. And when you watch one of his TED Talks, you'll see him do this. He's always looking for... Um, agreement with with the crowd so he'll say things like does that make sense or you know don't you think and it's, mm. it's these little things where he's he's putting the question onto the audience to get some engagement back from them and again using that subtle humor to really really engage people so Sir Ken Robinson I think he's done about three TED talks that I've seen and very very interesting one and it's around uh education mostly around children education Mate, you're absolutely right. I actually use a lot of those uh, inserts when I'm kind of speaking to people. Like I've said it to you already today, is I'm like, you know, and I, and I talk, 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 I'll give two or three analogies and I'll go, does that make sense? Do you know what I mean? You're looking for that feedback. Yeah. The the book I'm talking yeah, about that's is my the, art, the Art of Being Brilliant, which is by Andy Cope and Andy Whitaker. And it may sound very audacious and it doesn't show, show you how to be brilliant, but some of the just incredible ways that they speak and they because that's a big factor as an audiobook you know I'm, I'm obviously heavily into the audiobook world into the podcasting world and the way someone comes across you've got to like the voice you've got to like how are they playing with it is that is it is it monotone you know what's their what's their tomba what's their intention you know where are they placing their words i used to be terrible with silences and i'm actually still pretty bad at it anyway but you know leaving pause for thought when you're having a conversation with somebody is a, is a different aspect as well. But no, so we're obviously got a massive shed. So you started with TED Talks and stuff like that. Why did you want to develop? Because yeah. I actually started with the Tony Robbinses of the world. You know, I was high five in the mirror, NLP, yeah. big elbow deep into that because I'm a recovered addict and I went into personal development after my addiction because I just cross addicted to that basically. So, yeah, I mean, I think when it comes to your style, it's about being authentic. Um. And again, I was I was trying to be someone I wasn't. And how how can you be your authentic self? Other people can tell straight away that you're not who you're going to be. And I think this links really nicely into leadership is authenticity of who you are. Now, how many times have you heard someone, uh, whether it's in the fire service sector or public sector somewhere else, say, oh, they've been promoted several times. They've clearly swallowed the pill. What do people mm. mean when they say They've swallowed the pill. Have you heard that saying before, Pete? Yeah. They say you swallowed the pill yeah. or bought the farm is a more American yes. version of it. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what do they mean? And for me, if this is someone that's bought into the kind of senior vision of what they want the organization to look like, and I don't really have a, a problem with that, but what I think you tend to see is you tend to see people lose their authenticity as they move through that transition. And again, this is another thing why, I struggle to want to move on from the watch manager role is I almost felt like I would need to lose a bit of my authenticity. And I can, a great example of this is I can remember an officer coming down to our fire station one day and delivering a talk. And whilst I can't remember exactly what this subject was on, he, we asked him a question and the response to it was, well, do you want my version of it or do you want the fire services version? You know, so there was two different answers that he wanted to give. But he clearly felt like I need to give the fire service answer. Here. It's about authenticity. And when we're talking on stage or whether it's even to a small group or on a video call, just be yourself, you know, be yourself. It was one of the mm. best bits of advice 
that a friend ever gave me when I went for my very first promotion. They said, just go in there and be yourself. When I say it was really good advice, actually, it was terrible advice, but it was good for the long run. Because whilst I was myself in that interview and I didn't pick up my first ever leading firefighter role, okay. I did pick up a, um, a temporary stint somewhere else. Uh, and I very much learned that day that when it came to going for an interview, I needed to not quite be myself. I needed to kind of swallow that pill a little bit and put on a bit of a performance for what the organization wanted to see from me. Yeah. However, as soon as that interview was done and I was in post, that was the bit where I needed to be myself again. That really annoying, though, because like people have said to me, yeah. you know, I've done 23 promotion processes to get four jobs. So I've had four successful promotions out of 23. Yeah. And people always yeah. used to say to me, Pete, just that, that phrase, play the game, just play the game. And I'm like, I don't want to play your oh, fucking I've heard game. That so often. You know what I mean? And I'm like, yeah, but Pete, you can't change the thing from the outside. You've got to change it from the inside. So just play the game. And it just used to really piss me off because we spoke about diversity and things like that. All we really meant was I want someone that looks different has a different background, but thinks exactly the same as me. I want a yes person that thinks exactly the same as me. Whereas I was neurodiverse to hell. I was the weird guy who starts a goddamn podcast for, for crying out loud. You know what I mean? I'm that different way of going about yeah. something kind of person. And I had regular feedback, some formal, some informal, like, Pete, I love what you're trying to do in your role and how you're doing it, but you're a bit of a grenade. I'm not sure if you're actually going to be fireworks and it's going to be great for me and the department, or you're just going to blow up in my hand. You know, he says it really could go, and it's just too much of a gamble. But one of the station managers I did have, which I really respected, he used to have a really great way, similar to what you were literally just saying, that great piece of advice. Whenever I come to discuss something with him, he'd say, Pete, do I need my shirt for this conversation? And what he meant by that is not, do I need to go and get my shirt? It was like, do you want me to talk to you as your station manager or do you want to talk to me as your friend? And he'd always say that at the beginning of the conversation. Yeah, do I need my shirt for this conversation? And I'd be like, no, it's just, it's just, you know, we're just going to shoot the shit and just be honest with each other for a second. He's like, okay, so I'm not wearing my shirt for this. Um, and that was a nice thing because he really would. He says, you know, mm -hmm. and then even after the conversation, sometimes he says, right, now I've had that conversation. If you bring it to me as a watch manager it'll be a different conversation. But he was great like that. And he really was very honest and very trustworthy. Not like he'd bury stuff. He'd be like, because you're going to deal with that because we've had a conversation as friends. Do you know what I mean? But he'd be like, but if you brought that to me yeah. as one of my watch managers, it's going to be a different conversation. Um, and he was really, really good like that. Really, really good yeah. like that. And he helped develop me because that sort of comes on to, and I know we'll, 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 we'll dip our toe in it for a second because I know we're going to come on to it later, but it comes into that being able to have difficult conversations, um, fear of speaking honestly and speaking truthfully, you know, worrying about ramifications and stuff like that. And he was really good at putting me at ease, empowering me to do the right thing. But um, he was a very rare individual. Isn't it a shame that people like that are rare in yeah. our kind of sector that we work in? Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, I want to go back slightly on what you said there about kind of just you know you don't quite fit in was i think was what you were alluding to when yeah. someone said that you might be a bit of a grenade when you come in because you've gone through so many processes to get that position but what we're looking for in the organization i i i talk about uh diversity in in the in the organization and when i'm talking about this i don't mean just the fire service this is actually kind of across the board with lots of public sector and even private sector when we employ people, we say we want diversity. So I use colors and I use shapes to describe this. So yeah. we will employ a yellow triangle, we'll employ an orange circle, a red square, a blue square, you know, and all these different colors, all these different shapes. But right at the top of this organization, we have our blue squares. These are people <laughs> that have formed the blue square way of thinking of what they want to do. This is where we were talking about earlier about someone swallowed the pill. This is the blue square pill that someone has swallowed. Now, what tends to happen is people come in and they will blend in with their environment that's around them. So you might have a yellow triangle that's joined a team of blue squares, and it's very difficult to continue to be that yellow triangle. So something called group thinking, people will blend in around them. So their yellow triangle loses its authenticity and they start to, to become a bit more of a blue square. And I tended to find that I needed to adjust who I was if I wanted to progress up through the organization. 
And I just wasn't prepared to do that. I wanted to be my true, authentic self because I genuinely believed that there was value in what I had and the way that I approach things that was different to what other people did. And what and it, there's no, I mean, there's no blame here with with how people do this, but we tend to employ people that share similar views and opinions as us. So this is how we end up with this kind of culture of more blue squares sitting at the top of an organization than down the bottom because, you know, we attract people like us. It's what mm. happens. I'm going to give you something now, right? And I, I can't remember the origin of it, but I'm going to give you something now and it's going to frustrate you because I'm I'm going to give you a terrible version of it and you're going to go away and kill yourself <laughs> trying to think about it, right? I went to a great course in France when mm -hmm. I was part of a different organization and it was called strange shapes i think the exercise we did was called it was sort of something like this basically right you're only allowed eight shapes and you had to make this perfect shape and the perfect shape was a representation of an organization but the shapes they were giving you and because you were only allowed i think it was eight squares or eight um eight shapes you could only make it with a bunch of different shapes which were all different colors so you would do this as an exercise, yeah. and I'm really and uh, unless you've actually done the exercise, in which case, great, and maybe you already use it. In your, no. your, I'm going to drive you mad because I can't remember where it is. <laughs> you, I encourage you to go away and Google it afterwards because you can buy this as a set and use it as a coaching tool. And it was absolutely amazing because some people would go, "Tell you what, we're going to get three blue squares as an example." For if you just tried to get eight blue squares, you're not going to make the shape. Yeah, is kind of the principle of it. And then you have this yeah. discussion afterwards. It was an amazing teaching tool. And I can't for the life of me remember the actual proper name of the exercise, but I'm sure you can buy these and they're great teaching tools because it is such, and it just screamed at me and I'm terrible at staying quiet, but I managed to roughly hold myself to the end of your, your, your explanation there. Cause I just want to high five you through the computer screen because it's such a great tool. Do you know what? I've, I've never, yeah. I, I almost feel like that's it. I thought I had a really original idea, and now it really <laughs> no, I'm not saying you've nicked it from anywhere. I'm but that's saying, great like, because I, it's great. But, but this is this is great because it does already pre-exist, which means that someone else has had exactly the same thought as me yeah, yeah, in the past, and they've all over the world. People equally. having these same feelings as you and me, and it's like, yeah, it ain't it ain't a trick, you know. No, but this is someone has created this. That this now means that I can go and find it, and I haven't got to get my jigsaw out and like make some. You might end up having to because I've got to look Google and you can't bloody find it. But anyway, sorry, carry <laughs> on. no problem at all. So yeah, that, that that's what it was, and I was a, very much a yellow triangle in a blue square organization. I think towards the end, um, and just wanted to continue on my path. Now there was um, something that kind of changed my thought process on my leadership style a little while back. Uh, I read a book called Leaders Eat Last by Simon Sinek. I don't know if you're aware of it. But it's a great yes, book. 100%. Um, and when I, when I read this book, I was in that position where people were telling me that you need to be something different. You need to act in a more assertive way. You need to be a little bit more controlling in the way that you, 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 you sort of plan your days. You know, you, you're the boss effectively. You, um, you are in charge of these people and you tell these people what to do. And it wasn't, it didn't feel right. That wasn't the way that I wanted to lead. It wasn't the natural way that I wanted to lead. And very much the thing that I wanted to do was put people first. And it was when I put, found myself in a position of leadership, such as a crew manager or watch manager, I very much followed the ethos of, well, I'm here in this privileged position to look after all of these people. So I will do everything within my power to look after my team. And in return, what I saw is they would do anything for me. But I got it back tenfold because mm -hmm. I put them first and everything that I did, I was thinking about them. So when it came to asking for a favor or something, quite often I didn't even need to ask. They were already doing it for me. But I saw huge results because instead of going from this parent child relationship i ended up having this adult adult relationship you know so i was an equal i was showing my vulnerable side there was days when i wasn't quite on my a game but they would be and vice versa you know we would lift each other up and it brings me back to when you were just talking about your manager that you had there and you used the words like trust and mm -hmm. um honesty and i can't help but think that these must have been some traits that you looked at and thought i really admire them mm. about this manager so was this was this manager like a you know a guy that you you kind of really admired and looked up to 
hundred percent, hundred percent. There was only there was maybe ten or fifteen percent of things that he did, mannerisms that I either didn't want to or didn't think fit with my mental blueprint of leadership. But there was so much that you know, and I was probably it was probably almost cult like. You know, some of the things that if he was on station, you know, I, I I wanted I wanted my team to be at their best and I wanted to recognize and and celebrate people that were on my team because I wanted them to find excuses to connect with him and find, you know, ways mm-hmm. to get a little bit of that. Because sometimes the downside of senior leaders is they only speak to other leaders at times. And I wanted people on my team to see where I'd got some of the traits that i that they reference that i'm like wow well, god you need to meet so and so you know and every time they were there i'd just try and find excuses like invite them for lunch or whatever people probably thought i was sucking up to them or whatever but it was not it was just i wanted them to come without the shirt without their rank and have conversations around culture and the way that they just their conversational style and their ability to informally and subtly coach people to become better leaders, even just as a firefighter. And I say just as a firefighter, before you can lead anybody, you must be able to lead yourself. You know, self-leadership, self-discipline, your own values and being able to practice what you preach is something you do at an individual level. And and he did that so well. Yeah, no, I, I can totally relate to that. And I go back to when I mentioned John, my one of my first sub-officers that I had in, in Avon. He had exactly what you're explaining there i was so proud to work for john that i did i work i went above and beyond because he had everything about him that i admired and and at this point here when i met john i kind of came up with this idea of using my hand using my right hand to identify people in my life that i truly admired for all the right reasons and these were people in leadership positions whether it was within work whether it was in a sports team or you know my friendship group or even the family and i was looking at john and john was the first name that ever went on my hand and i wanted to extract three incredible qualities that he had that i thought if i could mimic some of them at some point in my leadership life then I know that I will be some way better towards being a better leader, if you like. So John, for example, the the traits that I admired about him was honesty, like you said, uh, with your, your guy, very, very fair. And he always used to deliver. So when I say fair, if I was in the wrong, he would tell me, but he would tell me in a really nice way. And I would take that feedback on board. So instead of being critiqued by John in a way that was really stern and being sort of like suppressed, I ended up having more respect for him and our trust continued to grow Mm. because of the way that he used to critique me. You know, equally, he would praise me 10 times over on the amount of times that he would critique me. So John was phenomenal. And, And that's one of the exercises that I would do with people in a workshop is to draw around their hand and identify five people that they truly admire and pick out three traits from those individual people that they like. And at the end of it, you will have 15 traits that ultimately make up the perfect leader or person that you want to be. And it's just about trying to mimic that from them. Now you could do the same on the other hand for the opposite, if you like. So if you're looking at people and going, what is it I don't like about, about Jim over there or, you know, Sam over there. You can do the same. And I think it's important to identify the bad traits in some people mm. without telling the world about it, but just, you know, keep it to yourself. What is it about that person that I don't particularly like? You know, what would it you know? And and then that has its value as well, but certainly the positive trait thing. Mm, 100%. Sometimes that process of elimination is easier as well, like agreeing what you don't like versus even when people think of what they want to do for the rest of their career and things like that it's like articulate for me what you definitely don't want to do or the definitely the the type of person you don't want to become um because i always say to people you know is your life going to be an example or a warning to other people because it will be one or the other they'll either think you know that's definitely the way i want to be and do my life or or, or the opposite will be the case as well and i think that's a really important um, but sometimes subtle thing for people to be able to identify with yeah, I agree totally. Agree totally. So take me next to that aspect of, you know, because you said there you did these roles and you picked up all of these these sort of positive uh, leadership traits and how people can improve their leadership skills. But 
you then made this incredible decision to step away from the the fire and rescue service yes i have and i I guess the reason behind it was being that yellow triangle in a blue square organization if you like and seeing the impact that i had in some of the teams that i worked in gave me that real sense of value with what i had done uh, and not only what i had done what we collectively had done as teams mm. so i th- i knew that the way that i had led and managed some teams brought out the best in others now i remember my first day going onto a fire station i uh, i got met by my station manager who said to me it was fair play for taking this watch on. They're probably one of the worst watches in the service. And I don't think he meant that in a in a really negative way, but I think sort of certainly looking at some performance factors and some of the individuals we had there, there was definitely some challenges that we needed to face. And actually what I found is that wasn't the case at all. I don't know whether it was something to do with the how they've been perceived by other people in the organisation, but I genuinely found this group of people to be a wonderful group to be with and I, I look so fondly back at this time um, and I remember being challenged on my very first day when I got there uh, we'd been there for about an hour and I had a training plan in front of me of what we were going to do for the next month that the previous manager had left behind and we got told that we had BA guideline drills no one likes doing BA guideline drills do they no, I mean, we've just sacked them off in a lot of services, haven't we? Thank God. <laughs> yeah. No, I, so I put this to the watch that we were going to do some BA guideline drills this day. And about half an hour later, after a bit of a meeting around the pump bay amongst some of the firefighters, <laughs> they came back and said, we don't think that we should be doing BA guideline drills today. We've got a probationer on the shift and he's on annual leave and we should do this next week instead. And I thought, OK, interesting, fair point. So what I did is so I kind of went, all right, well, why do you, you know, what would you like to do instead? And just by putting that one question back to them, they seem shocked at that whole concept of, oh, actually, maybe I've got a choice here. You know, I think that they were used to being told this is how it's going to be. This is what you will do. So we put the question back to them. What do you want to do? And uh, they thought about it for a moment and they were like, well, um well we'd like to do some high ab training instead it's something we haven't done for nine months and i said okay great let's uh let's look back uh at the training records let's see who needs to do what for whatever reason uh and if everything all kind of lines up then i think that's a sensible idea because yeah I, i can see the benefit to doing ba guideline drills with our probationer next week so with that we looked at training records and they were right. We didn't really need to do BA guidelines. So we did. We adjusted it and we changed. And that was something that changed their their view of me straight away. And it helped build trust because they came to me with what they believed to be a problem. And I think they already had this preconceived idea that they needed to be quite assertive in how they approached this. It, clearly, it was a challenge. It was going to be a battle, yeah. But I, but it was, but I treated them like adults and we had an adult conversation and we, we made a joint adult decision at the end of it. And I think just having um, that inclusive decision making amongst your team and treating everyone as equals and like your adults, rather than this parent child style of relationship of I'm the manager and I'm going to tell you what we're going to do really helped break down some barriers. Like I said, it built trust. And this is what we did with this team in the first few months was just work on trust. They needed to trust me and I needed to trust them. So we kept building and building. We had very open discussions all the time. I was learning about them. I was starting to find out what was going on in their work life, what their aspirations were. And I was just checking in uh, most of the time with them. In fact, I spent more time with my team talking to them about small little issues that they had going on or their I aspirations with where they wanted to go personal growth missions then i did in the office dealing with paperwork and it brings me on to a a watch manager's uh, conference that i was at where a question uh, sorry one of the um, uh, delegates on this watch manager conference put their hand up and said in front of a senior officer like i have too much admin to look after the people on my team and then all of a sudden more hands were raising around the room going i agree i agree i've got too much admin to look after my team and I can remember in that moment thinking, am I the only person in this room 
that spends so much time with their people that they can't get the admin. So for me, I was putting people first, admin came second. Um, and I'd always keep up with the admin. That was never a problem. But I would do it in, you know, the hours of darkness when other uh, team members were kind of, you know, resting or getting their heads mm. down. Is that a recognized, like, needed cost of, of, of leadership as well, though? Because having to do that aspect, because you need to yeah, keep the, uh, or exactly there's, a, there's a strong belief that you need to keep the spreadsheet happy. Oh, yes. Well, this, this was it. I mean, the spreadsheet was easy because, I mean, while we never falsified any records or, or anything like that, it's... You could have easily done that if you wanted to, to make your spreadsheet look good. You just had to empower people to want to do what needed to be done. And when I would say to them, how do you want your day to run today? Rather than this is the structure, you're going to do routines, then you're going to do your gym, then you're going to do cup of tea, breakfast break, then we're going to do home fire safety, then we're going to do training. I put it to them and said, "What? Well, how do you want your day to look? And as a collective, we, we changed it up. There was many times where we would have our meal breaks at different times because that's what people felt would work for them. People were actively going out of their way to do different training records. Was, I mean, this is this is testament. Anyone that works on a whole time fire station will tell you no one particularly likes working after the hours of 10 p.m. at night. Fuck no. And I mean, like, really a, a lot of work, you know, getting out there drilling or going out knocking on doors. It's just not appropriate that bit. But well, I found that our team were were getting together at 10 o'clock at night and they were just doing a little bit of training, but all completely unprompted. And it might be that they were helping a probationer out um, or a firefighter development doing some bits and pieces. It might be that they've gone, oh, do you know what? We've got a BA course coming up next week. I just want to run through like, like the BA policy or whatever, but they were doing it completely off their own back. So what had what we had done by creating this trust on this team and putting a barrier, put, well, putting a shield over our team and stopping all the negative vibes from things that we couldn't control. A little force field over our team and said, look, we can't control all of these negative things that are going on in the organization elsewhere. So let's focus on the stuff that we can physically control within our team. And this is about creating the environment that we want to create at work. So we were having regular check-ins with each other. We were providing support to each other. There was open communication going both ways, leading by example. There was a growth mindset that we were getting amongst other people on the team. Mm. Our team became this really wonderful, healthy place to be. We also built in this element of psychological safety. So nothing was kind of uh, off, off bars for when it came to what can we discuss but we always said that if we discussed it, we would discuss something in a way where we would try to learn from it. So we did this. And we ended up having probably one of the best performing teams in the world. Oh, say in the world, certainly in that organization. <laughs> in my opinion, I thought they were phenomenal. Yeah, of course. And you got to, mate. You've got to have that audacity. I thought they were fantastic. I honestly, truly believed in this team. I think every watch should have that aspect of the, you know, the serenity prayer. Mm. Serenity prayer is something we did a lot of in 12-step programs and, and through my addictions and stuff like that. And for people that are unfamiliar with it, it's a lot of the connotations is built around, I mean, the fact it's called a prayer. It is very religious context. But if you try and remove that aspect of it, it is very useful and powerful because there's also just a the big aspect of stoicism in there. And I don't know if the chicken and the egg, which one came first, but it effectively talks about you know granting yourself the serenity to accept the things you cannot change the courage to change the things you can and the wisdom to know the difference. And that is something that can stop people going down that path of putting so much of their cognitive horsepower into things outside of their control. Yeah, I totally agree. Totally agree with that. And yeah, this, this team were great. So the question was, why have I left the fire service to do mm. what I'm doing now? And I think it's just that the, the proof is in the evidence there that what I was able to bring to a certain team and what us collectively as a team created drastically improved the culture within the fire service, but in a small sector of that fire service. It's the only bit I could really control. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing, because I want to impact more than just one small team within an organization. I want to share the message so that we can get it out into other organizations, whether that's in the fire service, police, ambulance, and private sector. Because what we did, what we achieved, changed 
the culture in a very short space of time. It, I was there for two years, mm. literally two years. We went from having one of the worst performing teams to one of the best performing teams. So that's why I'm doing what I'm doing, because I want to make a difference. And I don't think that if I, if I stayed within the fire steps, I don't think I'd have had the same impact. 100%. And the sad truth of it is, uh, I think I think I agree to an extent. People um, talk to me regularly and say, you know, when are you uh, when are you going to quit the service? Then I says, what do you mean? And they says, well, you know, you're doing so much of all this stuff outside of it. Eventually, one of them is going to break, and you'll have to leave the service to go and continue to do more of the thing that you want to do. Because one of my things is, I always used to think I wanted to be a chief fire officer when I was in on call and when I first joined the whole time aspect of the role. Because I thought that would be the position where I could affect most change. And then when I started doing the podcast, not saying this is any more or less important than anybody at any different ranks, it's certainly just a different thing. But it reaches significantly more people. Um, and I believe it yeah, gives, it, it empowers people. It helps people feel less alone. Do you know what I mean? That they can hear people like yourself, hear all the other great guests. You know, that they'll hear James talking today and go, wow, yeah, okay, I, I feel less alone on this watch of 5, 10, 15 people where I'm trying to make positive change and my world is so small that it feels like I'm the only person trying to do it and they're not the only person trying to do it, you know, individuals such as yourself. But one of the things I did want to ask there is, unlike a lot of other business structures, you don't get an opportunity really or they don't formally put it in place for you to shadow or develop yourself into these teams before you take charge of them. So as an example for, you know, crew commanders, LFs, watch managers, sub officers, whatever, who are stepping into these roles for the first time, sometimes they don't have the ability to just sit and observe for a prolonged period of time like you would do in a lot of, you know, external organizations, organizations in the private sector. What are some of those maybe low-hanging fruit that people can improve their leadership skills, those sort of top tips that they can at least start to use those tools when they're moving into these new roles. Well, yeah, this is a really great point because the reality is what we tend to see is people get leadership coaching, leadership training after they've been put in this leadership position. Mate, they get it when they get into senior leadership teams, don't they? Yeah, it's like, oh, you, now you're going to go on the man in That's... the mirror course. You're going to go on the... It's like, it's a bit fucking late now. I've already done all the damage. You know, when you know. first step into those leadership roles is when you really need the biggest support, I think. Well, you just got to look back at when when do you physically start leading people? And I, I reflected back on my life and it was very much when I was at school and not just school, primary school. I remember being the captain of our primary school football team. You know, that is a leadership position. I mean, I'm eight years old. Mm. I get that. But that is like effectively my first kind of leadership position that I had. You know, and we can have leadership positions within our friendship groups, whether we're down the pub, whether we're out kayaking together or whatever it might be. But leadership skills are needed in almost every aspect of our life. Mm. So I'm when sorry. it comes to the workplace where it feels like there's a reluctance to invest leadership training in people until they are in a leadership position and when i say leadership position this is like effectively a management position that's what we're yeah, looking at that's, that's so the many firefighters i ever worked with were leaders absolutely leaders and they could just have been uh mentors they could have been coaches but they were helping other people whether that was people on their own watch on other watches stations uh, or even outside of the service these people were in leadership style positions in my view anyway so when you ask what can people do in the first instance, I think from an individual perspective, uh, a little bit of um, kind of self-development is a good thing. So look at some books, look at TED Talks. Uh, like Leaders Eat Last was a great book for me. That was a really, really uh, influential book in my life for my leadership journey. So I'd certainly look at that, certainly look at TED Talks, get on YouTube and see the bits and pieces on there around, you know, how you can develop yourself in leadership. The other thing that I would really recommend is get yourself a coach or a mentor. Better than that, get both. Get a coach and a mentor. So actively seek out someone that sits on your hand that you truly admire and ask if they will help coach you or mentor you. And the other thing with this is it doesn't need to be someone that sits within your own organization. And I can, I can remember a time where... Uh, I just finished a coaching session with someone and I, I was doing it 
during work time, but it was around communication. So I was developing my communication skills at the time. Uh, I came off of this uh, coaching session and um, another colleague turned around to me and said, oh, what were you up to then? I said, I was doing some coaching. And they were like, oh, who's your coach? And I said, oh, you probably wouldn't know who they were. And then their response was, well, I know everyone in this fire service. Uh, try me. And the reality was my leadership coach was someone that actually lives in the Netherlands. So they were like, you can't do that. You can't have a coach outside. And I thought, oh, no, this is like, this is almost like blinkered narrow mindedness. Yeah. So, just the People culture think that, 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 that we think. You, all you did was just tell me the size of your world. That's all you just told me. Exactly that. That if you want a coach and a mentor, you need, you just need a coach and a mentor that you admire. That and that's what you need to do. But equally, change it up. So use your coach for six months or a year. Have a really good relationship with them. And when you're trying to find a coach, get someone that really believes in you as well because they will absolutely help bring you on. It's got to be a two way relationship. You need to believe in each other. Mm. um so i'd a- absolutely look to do that uh, and also from an organizational perspective i think that we really need to review what level we do leadership coaching and leadership training on uh, and i think that that's something that we ought to bring in uh, a much i say lower i don't like using the term higher and lower in the fire service but you, people will understand what i mean bring that uh, that training in at a much lower level at kind of firefighter level without a doubt so that when we have got someone that has gone through promotion they're already building their leadership skills and practicing them on their own station as as it is so there's some things i think that we can do as individuals equally as an organization let's look at what we're doing lower down and, and this is probably a nice time to do a little plug because i do some leadership workshops as well so there we go 100 percent I think they're really, really useful for people, mate. I know I've had a look at a few of them. So give us give us some intro there and what's the because I know there's some toolkits that people can get hold of as well. We're going to stick some links in for it. When people are going away and using this stuff, or when they're looking at coming on some of these leadership development things, do you have them do any prep work? Is there any again tools that they can think about using? I mean, the, the workshops that I do, I don't tend to get people to do any prep work to begin with. And I do stuff on leadership excellence, psychological safety, and mastering difficult conversations. I want people to come in. I want people to be relaxed. And I want people to enjoy what we're going to do. We'll do loads of different exercises when we are are doing these workshops. Uh, And it might be that we're just having a one-on-one practice conversation with each other, or that we are going around the room and highlighting positive leadership traits that we truly admire in different people. There's there's lots of things that we do and that we explore. And certainly, you know, we, we may well send people away with things to think about or reflective logs that they can kind of go, do you know what? This, I want to do something a bit different here. But mm-hmm. um, for me, it's just about creating a really, really safe, nice environment for people to want to learn. And, 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 and this is the other thing. I see a lot of emphasis on... What qualification am I going to get from this? What qualification do you get from that? But it's not all about qualifications in this world. It's about experiences Mm -hmm. and learning from so many different people. And it's there was almost a bit of a trump card that was played of like, you know, what ILM have you done in leadership? Have you done the ILM three, the five, the seven, so on and so forth? Fucking useless. I know people with qualifications coming out of their ears who are so blind to their impact on other people yeah. it is um, there's a yeah. uh, there's a senior there's a member of a senior leadership team in a brigade that I've worked with who is just so incredibly oblivious to the impact that they have on the people around them and they're a coach you know what i mean and that just says to me sometimes yeah. they can pay they they probably paid a service uh, enough money to to qualify them as a coach and it's really really toxic that this individual and he, and he wonders why he says like i've offered to coach loads of people you know in my brigade and no one you know, no one takes it up so the offer's there for people and i'm like yeah but there are other people in your organization coaching people so maybe you know if someone calls you a horse i forget what film it was if someone calls you a horse you punch him in the mouth Two people call you a horse, you punch them in there. If three yeah. people call you a horse, you might want to just glance around and check you haven't got a saddle on your back and a tail. Do you know what I mean? Because it might be the case. Why are so yes. many people so averse to having you coach them or develop them? What is it about you that people do not want to, um, you know, they don't want any of that to bleed over into their way of, of dealing with people? 
Yeah, I, th- I think self reflection is so important though for all of our own development, isn't it? Mm. I can remember reading a um, uh, a study that someone did. I can't remember who it was, but they they ultimately concluded, and it'll be on a TED Talk somewhere. I guarantee it. But they concluded that about eighty five percent of us believe that we self reflect. So there's fifteen percent openly say, "No, I don't." self-reflect on what i do okay that's fine but 85 percent of us say that we do self-reflect um and practice it now interestingly of all of those people that self-reflect they reckon actually only around 15 to 20 percent of us actually self-reflect properly because of this bias of us wanting to view ourselves in a better way than it might be seen Mm. does that kind of make sense you know yes when it comes to self-reflection Mm. Yeah, so it's, it's definitely worth digging out this TED talk on it or finding this document somewhere because it is it is a fascinating study mm. on self-reflection. I was going to say, it brings me back to the other point that I said about uh, your coaching. You said, you know, there's people that have got coaching qualifications, but you'd never go to them for coaching because it's not someone you believe in. So what I said earlier about when you're picking yourself a coach or a mentor, pick someone that is an absolute role model for you that you want to work with. Yeah, what were you going to say then, Pete? No, I was looking at that aspect of low-hanging fruit for coaching as well. And I mean, like, because for for a lot of managers, um, and we do use that term manager because it seems to be so prolific among the organizations now, and it might be easier for some people to relate to. When they are sitting with their crews, because you said you used to spend the majority of your time sitting and having these cultural conversations, you know, listening to people, letting them feel heard. What are some of those tools, perhaps? Because people probably think they're talking to their teams on a regular basis but the impact and return on investment of those conversations when you're you know talking to leaders and the way in which they interact with their teams is there any kind of give people advice on how to have conversations where people enjoy and want to continue speaking to you and opening up to you yeah, I mean, are we going down the route of having a difficult conversation with someone or just any conversation with someone? I mean, the difficult ones are often the ones that people end up avoiding. But I always think to myself, the more mm. positive conversations you can have with people, the less likelihood is you're going to have to have a difficult one. So I suppose first and foremost, that aspect of having healthy conversations with your teams might be a good place to start. Well, yeah, let, let's let's go there because it's all about being informal for me and authentic so when you're talking to your team members again just make this a really informal thing be very relaxed with what you're doing find out what's going on in their world tell them about what's going on in your world as well and I I always used to find just having that small chat with someone even if it's just for five or ten minutes over a cup of tea or just going for a little walk around the fire station yard or wherever it is was a really nice way of just checking in with people keeping regular checks on people and and kind of knowing what's going on you know so it might be that there was a firefighter on my watch that you know his dog was quite poorly at home and he, no one really knew about it you keep it to himself but i was aware of it because i was having these little conversations mm. so i was able to kind of check in with him a week later you know when we came back to work and just go you know mate how's how's your dog getting on you know is his, is his leg any better little things like that matter mm. a huge amount and i knew the name of his dog you know his dog was called bernie I used to make notes about that, you know, because people think it's manipulation and stuff like that. But I make notes about my kids as well, because like my daughter Lily will tell me something really interesting she did with a friend at school yesterday. And her friend's like whatever, yeah. her friend's dog is called this, or her friend's mum is called that, or they've just and I'll make a little note about it because don't trust your memory because it'll fail you all the time. Because it's not false. You are sincerely interested, but you'll forget. So for like people on my watch and stuff, I would I would have little notes, you know, just like so-and-so's kids so-and-so's partner you know what they enjoy doing on their days off because yeah. i am genuinely interested but you just get past the point you can't remember loads and loads of people but i want to have those conversations with people and i am interested as to how they're getting on and, and what's what's going on in the rest of their life um because there's nothing worse than forgetting people's names you know forgetting the names of their families or getting them wrong um, because despite the best of your intention, all you're going to demonstrate to them there is that you don't really care. You're not really that interested. So if it is important, you know, write it down. Yeah. Because if you thought of it like procedures and guidance and stuff like that, because, oh, well, if you cared enough to be a great firefighter, you wouldn't have to ever read them. You'd just know them, right? But we all read them every day, you know, and we read them when we go out to incidents. doesn't mean yeah. we care any less. 
it's there. Exactly. So I would encourage people to, exactly. to have those little notes. I'm not talking about keeping a file on people. Yeah, I'm not talking about building a case oh, to no, get them the opposite of that. Yeah, I'm talking about, you know, just, just in my phone, I'd be like, ah, oh, you know, James's daughter's birthday is this weekend. You know, I'd, I'd love to hear how they got on. So, you know, I'll have it for next set. that I'll come and say, oh, you know, you went, you went to the beach last week or, you know, how did you get on at this? You know, how did so-and-so get on with his new freaking whatever his kite? You know, he had the Sunday football club, whatever. Those bits, because they're interesting conversations, but don't rely on your memory. Totally, totally. Simple things like, and how nice is it when someone says, oh, you know, oh, Pete, happy birthday, mate. I know it's your birthday today. By the way, you know, we've got your little card that we just had a little sign around and you've, you've, you've got everyone on your team has signed the card. Yeah. How nice is that when hmm. someone's just remembered that that small thing? And when we talk about other little things that we can do right now, hmm. I think um, this is a habit that I certainly got into earlier on in my in my life, not for too long, but so it was around speaking negatively, uh, you know, and certainly if you were sort of like getting involved in gossip around other people, if you're speaking ill of someone to an, another person on your team, so I might be speaking ill of Sam to Peter over here on my team, what is Peter going to think I'm saying about him when I'm speaking to Sam later on that day? You know yeah. what I mean? So that little thing of tr of getting involved in gossip, keep yourself out of the gossip, especially the negative gossip of what's going on mm. in your world. So small thing there, but that will help build trust with, with other members of your team as well. Another thing that I would suggest, if you say you're going to do something, do it. So if I say to my friend uh, Sam that I'm going to call them, at six o'clock tonight, make sure I call them at six o'clock. And if I get held up for whatever reason and I can't, I will quickly drop a message. Really sorry, Sam. I can't call right now. But I, you, you, it is really important. I will catch up with you at seven o'clock or something. But when you say you're going to do something, follow it through and do it. Again, it helps build trust with what's going on there. Um, and the other little thing that you can do is just talk to your team. Find out what it is about uh, that's going on in them as a collective that they want to improve on or whether it's you're speaking to individuals and what they want to improve on but find out ways or find out find out their areas that they want to develop and then help provide those development opportunities for them mm. really really simple thing but by doing that you know I had it with a few people on my shift that were like and actually I'm now thinking about going for promotion these are like people who have been in the fire service for 15 years you know, and then all of a sudden they're now inspired and thinking, actually, I could be a manager here. I, I could go into one of these roles. So, right, let's let's see what we can do. Let's do some uh, instant command training on station. We used to get like YouTube videos up of yeah. a house fire or a car crash or something like that. And we used to talk through the scenario. What would I do when we were going? It was just providing informal development opportunities. On top of that, we would seek out some more formal development opportunities. And I can remember even putting in training requests for things that were completely out of the box stuff that wasn't traditionally supported by the fire service so i would look to get uh so we had like a couple of people that were well and truly into doing first aid and trauma on the shift so i would seek out trauma conferences that were taking place around the country and see if i could get them onto these trauma conferences so it's just about providing opportunity for people to grow and on that on that point there, this team that I spoke about earlier, where we created this incredible environment, an incredible uh, uh, team, I I had a manager come down to me towards the end and say, "What's the problem with your team? It looks like four people have um, put in an application to go for promotion. Is there an issue here? Isn't that an interesting concept that someone thinks there's a problem on a team when you've got so many members of your staff that want to go for promotion?" Because the, the actual, the flip side of that is that the culture was so good that people were so happy to step out of their comfort zone and mm. go into this fear growth zone by going for promotion. It was perceived to be a problem somewhere else. That makes sense. Yeah, 100%. Leaders make leaders, you know, is another, is another great aspect yeah. that people forget. The role of a leader is to get people to outgrow you. And it's the same when you speak about coaches. You know, I, I I have issue with someone that says, oh, I've had the same coach for 10 years. Now, if that coach has continued to develop in themselves, then, okay, the learning journey can sometimes continue. But a coach, you know, if you were coaching some, I used to coach people in uh, health and fitness and things like that. 
Now, I would struggle to coach a professional athlete because they're trying to go from stage 37 to stage 43. But I could take you from steps 3 to 12. And then you, if you want to continue to go, if you want to move into that regional, professional, national athlete level, you're probably going to need to go deeper down the rabbit hole and find a coach that can get you into those marginal gains aspects. So I think great leaders and great coaches are there for a period of time in your journey, like you alluded to earlier, and having the uh, the, the sort of freedom and also the acceptance that you will outgrow the people around you and you should outgrow the people around you. Do you know what I mean? That, that, that That's what development's all about for me. I wanted to sort of change yeah, it, tracks a little bit because I, I'd feel remiss if we didn't, you, know, you and I could so easily go down this romantic uh, sort of mirror and also just talking into each other about the same sort of thing, but also this echo chamber of only talking about the positive aspects of it. And we're not going to pretend to have the solutions for mm. a lot of these things, but I know something that came up only a couple of days ago. There's been a lot of stuff around poor cultures and toxic cultures in the UK Fire and Rescue Service. And I think it was ITV, Paul Brand, who I've actually uh, spoken to about coming onto the podcast, about some of the news that came out from Avon. I mean, Avon have had a really rough ride um, with some of their cultural reviews and some of the news that's come out. And this guy, um, whose name escapes me, Rob Davis, I think it was, a former senior leadership team. And yeah, that's right, yeah. All these, the salacious headlines, and I'm not trying to pretend this wasn't the case because I don't know the gentleman and I wasn't there, but driven to suicide. I mean, the, the gentleman didn't take his own life, which is thankful, and I'm not pretending that the... I well, don't wish that the headline was true and that they had taken his own life, but the fact that this individual found themselves at that level in the, in their career, in their service, and still feels like they were having you know, these, these sort of poor instances. So I maybe wanted to talk to you about, because the fact this person's had to go to, you know, a public inquiry or to go out into the media is probably at some level in their career, they've been faced or led by people who have really struggled to have difficult conversations. And they've, 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 it's driven this person out of the service. It's driven the person out of enjoying the job that they loved for so long. So I wanted to ask you, I suppose it underlies that aspect of psych psychological safety as well. Having difficult conversations in environments where people can still feel safe so they're not driven to these extremes that we read about. Yeah, I think, um, I think the first thing to kind of like note there is you, you summed it up really nicely. And uh, Rob Davis, who, again, I would, I would, I would say was a really lovely guy, was, still is a really lovely guy has been incredibly courageous with speaking up. And I think that by doing so, he will inspire other people to also reflect on some of their own experiences of what they're, they're seeing in the fire service. And I can only see that whilst this was an awful thing that Rob had to go through and Rob experienced, I don't think Rob's alone. I think many no. other people are experiencing the same issues, uh, even down to suicidal thoughts. I'm I'm well aware of several people at work that have experienced suicidal thoughts through workload and some of the experience that they've had. So mental health is incredibly important and something that we, we need to do more on moving forward. Mm -hmm. But what Rob will do, Rob will inspire others to step up and and be as courageous as he has. And I I applaud him for it and I'm incredibly proud of what he's done you're right there is cultural problems um and we can't ignore that it keeps coming up in reviews so i mean there was the independent cultural review that took place in london last year where there was clearly issues that were highlighted we've had similar cultural issues highlighted within avon when i worked there and i know many other fire services and other organizations outside of the fire service have these cultural issues to varying degrees whether it's around diversity and inclusion bullying harassment misogyny resistance to change or command and control management styles and there's so many other things that we can look at i mean mental health and well-being i think the statistics you look at it and it, it makes up something like 42 percent of uh, causes for sickness in the yeah. public sector i mean that's ludicrous when i joined 20 years ago the number one cause for sickness was muscular skeletal injury. And that was something like 20, 25% then. But I was going to say it took um, over musculoskeletal injury a little while ago, didn't it? And this is, I think 80% of mm. the cost of most organizations is staff. 
you know, paying staff. So when you've got such a huge bucket of that going ill, when it's things that are within your sphere of control, and I know we might argue musculoskeletal is in our sphere of control and all the manual handling and blah, blah, blah. Yes, we do that. But we now need to recognize that this mental health stress, there are many aspects within that that are within our own control as well as organizations that are ultimately caring for these individuals. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we, we need to be doing more about it. I mean, I don't think it's any any secret that, you know, the, the fire service is dwindling in its numbers uh, with staff and ex- there's more expected of people. And you just got to look around. And we spoke very earlier about the role of a station manager, a group manager, an area manager, and how difficult that role can be. And, you know, we mm. see people that we admire and we think these are great people. They go into these roles and they look broken. Well, not all of them, but some of them look broken for taking on the job. Mm. This is a prime example of Rob displaying exactly that there i think maybe rob was a a yellow triangle amongst blue squares in the end where just wasn't didn't feel like he was being listened to Mm. it's um it's a tough one and i think knowing how to change culture is a difficult thing to do because you can't change culture overnight it's not a right that's it we're going to change culture statement and things change it doesn't happen like that the way it happens is by inspiring change And this is about speaking to people and getting a message out there, being really open with some of the experiences that we've had, such as Rob's experience. Mm. That is where we are going to start seeing some change is about inspiring other people. And this is where we look at, you know, some of the leaders that we we've looked up to in the past, Pete, and think, right, I want to be like this person. And that person has inspired me to be a better leader. And if I can then go on and inspire someone else, that's great. And if they go on to inspire This is where we're going to start seeing some change. We need to create an element of psychological safety within the service too. Uh, And when I talk about psychological safety, I mean, it's the definition of psychological safety. This is a whole new term that's come out of late. Okay, Uh, It's kind of a bit of a buzzword. But psychological safety, to give it its definition, is a belief that one will not be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas questions concerns or mistakes and that the team is safe for interpersonal risk taking and that's like a quote and a definition from amy edmondson she's an expert on on all of this she's effectively written the book on it Mm. but we need to look at creating that and this is something that when i spoke about the team that i worked on we created really well Uh, we we would talk about things and it was always the case of let's speak openly let's speak honestly so that we can address these problems in the room that if there are any problems in the room so Mm. nothing was nothing was off bars when it came to that the other thing that needs to happen is we need to challenge what we see so if we see something that we don't agree with and it might be that someone's speaking ill of someone else or it's it's racial slur bullying whatever it might be it needs to be challenged and there's two ways that i've seen things be challenged traditionally in the fire service now the first one is is public shaming so the person gets told right that's out of order don't do that and we publicly shame them in front of other people yeah um it's almost seen as nipping it in the bud the problem with going down that route and shaming people in that way is that it takes away from the trust that has been built and developed up to that moment It also stops any potential opportunity for having a conversation to understand the underlying reasons for why that person has acted or said what they in in the way that they did. Hmm. The other thing that is likely to happen, and this is the most likely thing that will happen, is something bad happens or something inappropriate takes place and then it's ignored. And my belief for why this is ignored is because people don't know how to have a difficult conversation with someone Mm. so instead of having the difficult conversation they ignore it and then we know that because it's ignored it's accepted Mm. so then that problem gets worse that person what you permit you promote isn't it your job as a leader is also to protect the incredible people that you have in your team because as soon as they see so and so getting away with whatever then there's no reason for them they almost it's the old analogy. I'm not disappointed. I'm not angry. I'm just disappointed. You know, when you see your leader yeah. permitting someone else to behave in a certain way, you you just lose faith in them, don't you? Oh, totally. And 
And the other thing that comes with that is double standards. So one person might get called up for it while the other, someone else might not. And this is because a manager feels comfortable challenging Sam, but they don't feel comfortable challenging Pete over yeah. here. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, but for me, the solution lies in neither of those two things. We shouldn't ignore it and we shouldn't shame in public gen as a general rule of thumb. I, I very much follow the ethos of, you know, if you've got to critique, you do that in private. And if you want to applaud, you do that in public. Mm -hmm. So the way around this is to question. So imagine, Pete, that you've said something inappropriate about Sam um, that sitting across the table from us. So instead of shaming you, what I'm going to do is question it. And I go, Pete, that's a that's a really interesting um, comment you've just made there. Why, why do you say that? So what I'm doing is I'm questioning it. I'm opening it up. So look at it this way now, Pete. You're now thinking, oh, James has picked up on this and he doesn't like what's been said. And equally, he's now challenging me. So now you're going to do one of two things. You're going to either apologize profusely, say, yeah, really sorry. I've just said something there. Slip of the tongue. I shouldn't have said it. Um, mm. Really sorry, Sam. You know, if I cause offense, that don't mean to cause offense. Mm. Great. That's been nipped in the bud in a nice way. I always try and um, put is... myself as a, in a position of vulnerability when I always use the term, help me understand. So I'd go, James, help me understand what you meant by that. Yeah. Because from where I'm standing, that's not a perspective yes. I really share. Or you know, help me understand that because I don't think I agree with you. Do you know what I mean? And it's that help me understand yeah, that's... that I always try yeah. and lead in with. Because it's not me coming yes. in saying, you're wrong. Or what you've just said there is inappropriate. It's that initial just fingerprint. I'm just I'm just going to poke the paper here and test what you thought you just said. Yeah? Because it's an also an as you you know, perfectly yeah. articulate there. It's yeah. an ability for you to go, actually, yeah, I, I think I've perhaps misspoken there. Or what I was trying to say was A, B, C, and X, Y, Z. And then it allows you to go, oh, fantastic. Because what I thought you said yes. was one, two, three, four, five, six. In which case, I completely disagree with you. And I'd perhaps, you know, work on reframing that because of what, you, what you've obviously tried to say there is... Is A B C, um, which which elements of that I can certainly agree with, you know. But, but that helped me understand is sometimes a nice lead in because just getting you getting the conversation started is difficult for people as well. Oh, it is, yeah. And people don't know how to do that, but it, we've got to question it. And this is the thing that you do is you question it in an inquisitive way. But by putting that question there, it's already planted the seed that the other person is now thinking, oh, maybe I've spoke out of turn there, or you know, maybe they're challenging me. But they're challenging me in a nice, in a in a in a different way, in a supportive way, I guess. Mm. So you can do that and challenge it. And what this will now do is it will now start to open up a conversation where we can explore the underlying reasons behind why something is being said. Yeah. So, like I said, they'll either apologize profusely or sorry, or they will go on and give you the explanation behind why they're speaking in such a way. I mean, there is that risk that they will just stand up, walk away, and if they do that, okay that stopped the conversation, but we can then come back and revisit it a little bit later. Mm. Um, and even if and they I, do I do that, this... with the greatest of respect, it's yeah, still a on. demonstration to your team that, well, Pete or James has clearly challenged this. That person didn't have the emotional intelligence or the bandwidth to pursue that conversation yeah, further. Exactly. Or they recognized that they were really out of line. And, they've, and, and then it's not the ideal way to do it, but at least you have shut the conversation down which is not what you want to do that wasn't your intention and maybe with that individual you might try a different no. thing later but what people then get a very clear understanding of because either they get a subtle understanding of it and they're able to see you unpack it and navigate this conversation or if it is something that is clearly way outside of left field they can see that it's been addressed and shut down and that i'm sure Pete or James is obviously going to be continuing this conversation privately at some point. Yeah, exactly that. Exactly that. And I mean, I've got this um, performance management model that I use. I created this performance management model. I, I knew I was onto something with this one because I, I use it so often with difficult conversations. Um, but I knew I was onto something when I had a senior officer repeat my performance management model back to me one day and tell me that I ought to adopt it. It would be a really good thing for me if I had to deal with difficult situations. <laughs> so I was like, aha, light bulb moment. This works. I know this works. So I've been using this for about 10 years. And it's it's uh, it basically, it's called Pub is R&R, P-U-B-I-S-R-N-R. 
And it's a, a model that I use to have difficult conversations. And it could be something like attendance management, dealing with inappropriate behavior, someone that's not performing on the incident ground or in the training grounds, uh, even down to someone that's really suffering with their own mental health. Um, and interestingly, my partner has used this on me and I clocked it halfway through, but it worked. It really worked. So what does pub is R and R stand for? So the P is problem. And this is about the very quick identification of a problem. Like I said, it could be the problem is uh, said person is turning up 10 minutes late for work every single Wednesday. There's a problem. We're identifying that. U stands for underlying issues. And this is the why question. So why is someone doing it? We've identified the problem. We spoke to the person. Well, we've seen that this is the problem. Why are you turning up? So we're now trying to explore the, the thought process behind why someone is behaving in a certain way or saying something. Uh, P U B. B is behavior. Behavior is now exploring how people feel. And this is the, how do you feel about that? You know, do, do you feel all right because you're turning up late? You know, do you realize this has a, an impact on others? So it's almost using that dartboard of starting in the middle with yourself and the individual and then building outwards on how it affects and how other people feel about it. Mm. So individual, yourself as the manager, then your team, then it could be your station, it could be the organization and the community. You're building this out on how it can impact and affect others around you. Then we get on to the I, which is improve. And the key thing here is we're looking for a way that we can make the situation better moving forward. And the word that I like to use here is we, because I want to know how we can improve. And as a leader, I want to be part of that solution if that is appropriate and if that's what they want, because I want to help support them mm. going through this system. This isn't a hit you with a stick. This is I want to make things better and I really want to help make it better. Then we get on to the S and this is about setting a review date and the we can do this either formally or informally, but it might be that I just catch up with you next week over a cup of tea, or it might be a more formal thing where we arrange a time in the calendar and we come in and we chat about it. So it's just about making sure we follow up with someone else to check to see how they're feeling. R&R hmm. &R at the end is just about recording and reviewing. So this is about recording the type of conversation that you've had with someone. Again, if you're going formal, you could do it in a, in an email format if it's an informal one you might just drop them a text later just going look you know we know we had a chat earlier today just want to check in and make sure things are all right mm -hmm. we spoke about xyz um how are you feeling now uh, and review it is coming back to it and as part of the review this is something that i would hugely suggest that we do is self-reflect mm -hmm. and sometimes we don't look at that self-reflection side of it we look at the other person as having the problem but you've got to look at yourself and think, certainly when you're a manager and you're a leader, is go, is there something that I have done to begin with that has meant that this person thinks it's okay to act in the way that they did? And if you can't see that, sometimes it would be worth asking others if they can see something that you're doing that's allowing it to happen as well. So it's seeking feedback from other people. So that's effectively what my having a difficult conversation model is all about. It can be used very formally. It can be used very informally. Mm. Uh, it can be used to treat performance-related issues. But equally, you can flip it on its head and you can use it to praise people as well. So instead of the problem, you're, you're not identifying, you're, you're identifying the area of praise that you want to do, you know, and then exploring it that way as well. Does that kind of make sense? Wicked. No, that absolutely, mate. And uh, I suppose I'd add into that um, in that, you know, problem identified understanding where they are show why they're showing up like this you know why those aspects are showing themselves do you, do you ever use the sbi model as well so it's a similar variation just on that beginning bit which is when people are struggling um, to identify no, yeah, or articulate. no i haven't really yeah i forget who came it's not yeah. mine um it's uh when people are struggling to identify a problem or get again just get that conversation started Using something like SBI, which is situation behavior impact, is helping someone. So, like, if I SBI'd our podcast for for a quick bit of feedback to you, assuming it didn't go how it has gone, I might say, "Look, James, 
you know, during our conversation today, because a lot of this has got to be based on fact, the impact is the only bit of your opinion that you're going to insert into this feedback. Situation is, we did a podcast this morning and it took around two hours to do. Situation, fact, yeah. Behavior. During that conversation, yep. I recognized that you kept looking away from the screen. You seemed to be writing something down. The impact of that is I felt very disengaged. I didn't think you were interested in the conversation that you were having. I actually found it quite unprofessional. It was very distracting for me. Help me understand what it was like from your perspective. Do you know what I mean? So that's the situation behavior impact because yeah. the impact intended versus impact felt because I make a lot of notes all the time when I'm having a podcast. The impact that I'm trying to have is I don't want to interrupt you, but you have said something really interesting and I want to circle back to it because I'm really interested in your opinion on it, but I don't want to be rude and interrupt you. But the impact felt might have been, I thought James was doing some work off to the side. He wasn't engaged in the conversation that we were having. And that can be a whole host of different um, scenarios and situations that you can put that SBI over the top of. And I wonder if that probably helps sitting inside that, you know, that initial pub aspect of it as as a side note for the behavior, you know, the exploration and explaining the impact. Oh, it does. Because it's like, it gives yeah. because people often when you try and give feedback, people go, "Well, give me a situation, Pete. You know, give, give me wh- when when did that happen?" And you can go straight into SBI. Well, yesterday, you know, at around yeah. five past seven, we were on parade and there was six of us there. You were late showing up. You know, you showed up five minutes late, um, and this is the third day that that's occurred. Fact and fact, we were on parade, and this was the fact. The impact on that X, Y, Z, A, B, C, the rest of the team, accountability, perception of how much you care or don't care. And then if it gives them the opportunity to come back with a non-emotive intention, you know, situation, behavior, impact, what was their intended impact? What did they think the impact of their behavior was having on the rest of the team, on me, on the situation, on the team and watch and culture that they're part of? And then you can then follow also straight into that improving, reviewing, recording those aspects of it as well. And again, there'll be a million different models for all of this and you don't want to complexify something so much that it becomes a tool that people struggle to use. But I think that pub is R&R is a really, really great model that people can flex to their own personal styles. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you. And your SBI model there, it fits so nicely into the pub side of it as well. Mm. Um, the bit, the reason why I created this model is I, I felt like the underlying reason, the individual's kind of why for the reason behind why they were acting in such a way, was rarely explored in my experience. So mm. that's why I felt like it was so important to have that in the first instance. Is mm. this is a problem or this is the situation that I've seen? Why? Let's instantly let's let's try and get some understanding from you before we then go on and explore how it has impacted us individually. Um, Because again, one of the things I used to experience with this, and certainly when I was going through promotion processes, was I felt like I had at some point to point out that you are um, behaving in such a way that this could form a formal or an informal disciplinary, and this was going against XYZ policy, Mm -hmm. you know? And it almost felt like by doing that, you're not having a supportive conversation. You're having a conversation which is intended to support, but actually just by the sheer nature of the elements that we're talking about and throwing policies at you, mm-hmm. where all we're doing is we're we're just dropping down on that trust and you're not going to engage with me because you're not seeing what's in it for you. Because when you're having this conversation with someone, you've got to ask yourself what's in it for them. You know, and if someone needs to, if someone wants to engage with you, they have to have a reason to want to engage. There's got to be something in it for them. Yes. So in, in the examples that we've looked at today, it is about identifying what that is and giving them an opportunity to have something in it for them as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the reason why I think this is so important, I've got a standalone workshop on having difficult conversations. That is, they say the reason it's so important is because th- there's there's been several polls that have taken place out there around managers and how comfortable they feel having a difficult conversation with an employee and i Mm. looked at one um, recently and 69 percent of managers have reported feeling uncomfortable communicating with their employees in general let alone having a difficult conversation (laughs) with them let's now put this into the fire service sector that we're very familiar with 
how much of station manager, group manager, area manager time is spent dealing with issues that potentially could have been dealt with by firefighters, crew managers, and watch managers on their station if they had already had the support, the training to have difficult conversations in a supportive way in the first instance. Hmm. Again, I look back at my time working there and I never needed to, I I, I didn't ever have to put someone on a disciplinary. And I, on self-reflection, when I look back, I think it's because I had so such a good relationship with the people that I worked with that we were constantly checking in with each other. So whenever a small niggle came up, we had that really, really good conversation and supportive conversation in the early instance before it grew legs, before it got out of hand, before it affected other people and resentment and anger and all these other things started to build up. So it comes back to having difficult conversations will help create the culture that will it, it, it will help improve the culture within the fire service and other sectors i absolutely believe that 100 percent. the other thing it will do is it will free up those senior managers to do the things that they should be doing so that they're not coming down treading on people's toes all the time um, and they can get on with the work that they believe is important which is equally as important if you like mm-hmm. so there we are does that make sense <laughs> It does, mate. You're right. And a there's a frustration tangent. for them. <laughs> yeah. No, there's a frustration for people in those roles of, you know, feeling they need to micromanage people because we are in a very unique position now. It's not that we've never been there, but, you know, we mm. haven't been in this position probably for 30, 35 years where we are. And that's why I think the work that you do is so important now because we're going through such a colossal turnover of staff. We're going through so much recruitment through the fire and rescue service. There's a lot of uh, lack of experience or lack of length of careers, two different things in the fire and rescue service that we need to really lean in and focus very diligently on the way we're developing leaders at all levels of the organizations because doing it wrong now is writing a check that we are going to have to keep paying for the next 25 years if we do it wrong because people are rising really really fast and uh, they will miss opportunities to develop and especially with things like direct entry processes as well as and whilst i think people coming in from external companies Mm. external organizations will actually bring some wonderful diversity into here we need to support them in the way that they can manage and lead teams because a lot of these will be very intelligent subject matter experts academics often from other areas of different sectors which will bring a great diverse way of thinking to the services but they may or may not have had a lot of guidance on leading individuals. And you'll know far better than anybody, firefighters are a very unique, eclectic bunch of individuals when it comes to leading them. They're very passionate. You know, they're very romantic. They're very cult-like in ways about the way they think about the job that they do. It's very special to them. And you need to find a way to, to manage and speak and lead these individuals because they will give you feedback. They'll give you feedback very, very quick and very, very direct and very, very strong. And I have concerns for people stepping into new leadership positions that they don't have the tools to be able to deal with that. Um, And like I've already said, we'll pay the cost of doing this wrong for a very, very long time. And also maybe even to the extent that, you know, people will choose to leave the job. We'll lose a lot of incredible people if we don't support them. Yeah, I I agree. Uh, And I think we're already losing really good people from the organization. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I literally had a text message from someone yesterday saying, What's going? What's going wrong? There's so many good people that are leaving the service at the moment, um, and we need to look at ways in which we can uh, keep people in. Uh, I think going back to something you mentioned earlier about this kind of culture of where we now have this zero tolerance to what we stand for, which I I have got a zero tolerance for you know all these horrible negative things around bad culture with bullying, harassment, misogyny, and all this sort of stuff. I do have a zero tolerance to it. It's about how we go about dealing with that yeah. and providing support to people, providing opportunities. The key thing with leadership is trust. Mm-hmm. We need to build trust. And I do worry that there's an element of trust which is just just dropping off in the fire service and other sectors because I mean, I don't know if you've you've experienced it. I've certainly experienced it, and I know other people experience it, where there's this negative discussion and talk about things that are going on in other parts of the organization. And that's Mm -hmm. no good because that is absolutely 
smashing any kind of trust that sits somewhere. So yeah. we need leaders to be building trust. We need them to be inspiring people. And we had a chat earlier on, didn't we, off the air about um, Sabrina Cohen Hatton and how she seems to be doing this phenomenal job of um, She's crushing and building it. Love trust. It. In. And I'm sure a lot of people will she... hate her for it. I'm sure a lot of people will be scared and dismissive of the way she's doing things. But she's being super yeah. open, super I, transparent. I she's putting herself out there. You know, oh, she's saying things yes. differently. Oh, she's she's using different words that we wouldn't usually hear from leaders like that. And fucking what? Do you know what I mean? I think it's so sad yeah. that something like the podcast even has to exist and that I have to do it completely separate from the brigade service that I am part of because we don't have a culture of trust. You know, we don't have a culture of allowing people to speak freely. And she is at the top of the totem pole in, in that theoretical pyramid structure that we usually identify with organizations. And she is going for it. Do you know what I mean? And, and that's what I love. And I can only imagine the umbrella of safety and trust that creates for the people that work with her. Exactly. And she's, she's there. Yeah. A true person that should sit on your hand of someone that you should admire really, because she's surrounding herself with people of different colors and different shapes uh, and that is the sign of a really, really good leader is that they've got people that are uh, willing to challenge what's going on and they're willing to listen to what other people are doing rather than surrounding yourself with more blue squares. Mm. So yeah, hats off to her. She's she's phenomenal for it. And she's inspiring change. She's writing books. She's uh, doing keynote speeches. She's doing podcasts. I know she's done stuff with you. Yeah, man. This is a person that isn't just inspiring within the organization that she works in. Yeah. She is inspiring people all around the world that work in this sector. I mean, I've got her book here on the gender bias, and I read the, her last book as well. It, it's, it's phenomenal what she's doing. And I honestly, I applaud her so much. And we need more people like Sabrina in the fire service at the moment well people need to be able to feel comfortable enough just to get over themselves as well because again she she does do oh, stuff in it. different ways that if someone at a firefighter level did that they go <laughs> this fucking idiot writing bugging books about yeah. whatever doing it's social just, media just, posts and whatever but just because that person's a chief fire officer people go oh no it's different they're uh oh yeah, was, oh yeah very very inspiring very whatever look as long as you're doing it in a positive manner do you know what i mean as long as you're doing it and you're still upholding and reflecting the values you know you can still be flexible in the language that you use because i always say it with my children but it's not what you say it's how you say it do you know what i mean because getting back to that culture yeah. of trust and safety look i've got a zero tolerance for my children being racist but if my daughter sees something on tiktok and she repeats it at the dinner table i'm not going to sack her from the family am i i'm not going to th- she's 11 no. years old no yeah I'm going to try and understand because that's not, that's not who she is. Do you know what I mean? I'd be like, sometimes I would say to her, look, I I love you, but the way you're behaving, I'm struggling to understand because that's, that's not you. Do you know what I mean? And, And I always say, talk to a person as you want them to be as well. Not just as you see them today, because they might just be having a really bad day, you know? And I say things to my daughter, like, I know. I love your creativity. I love how funny and hilarious you are. You know, how you talk to me and mommy at dinner table, some of the jokes you come up with. Uh, And that's what surprises me so much about the thing you said at lunch, you know, because that was really, really out of left field. You know, I I helped daddy understand a little bit about what that was, you know, because that was really interesting. I heard that and it kind of had that head talk moment, you know, when daddy tilted his head and I was like, wow, what was that? Um, And then, you know, I'm not going to sack her on the spot for that excitable misinterpretation of some information she saw and didn't fully understand. And she's just regurgitated it in a moment of, of, you know, vulnerability really, because she doesn't have a wider context and understanding of the things that she's saying. Yeah, no, you, you, you've absolutely nailed it there. And there's another thing that you just did there in that, in that example with your daughter is you, when you were having that conversation, you filled it up with praise as well. And you, so it wasn't, a, I'm going to hit you with a stick instantly. There's, there's praise in amongst it. I think you're creative. I think you're funny. I think you're really lovely. But then please tell me about this. And this is another thing that we need uh, as human beings is we we need that sense of significance and belonging and and that praise from other people showing us that what we're doing is right and we are on the right path and we are growing. Because when we receive praise from people, it gives us that little boost. It mm. makes us want to do a bit more mm. and it helps build our trust as well. But we equally when we then need to have that difficult conversation 
we're open to it. So I could say you do that with people on the watch, people that like you're a new watch manager, new crew manager, wherever, and there's a 15 year firefighter there. Make them part of, they already are part of the leadership team, whether you think they are or they aren't, they bloody are. They're a cultural architect on that watch. So yep. take that individual aside and be like, yeah, dude, you know, we 100% need you as part of this leadership team because you've got such experience. I mean, you know, would you be open to leading this session today? Because your level of experience with this particular appliance, with this particular skill set, this particular risk on the patch, you know, I actually, you know, I'm, I'm new to the team. I don't know a great deal about it myself. I'd love to love it. So then when you're having those conversations around, you know, James, you people really, really respect you on this team. You know, I've heard so many great references, even when you're not here about, oh, you know, I love the way James does that. Or actually, I learned this thing. James had showed me how to do this. that, And they speak about you with such reverence, which is what surprised me so much when, you know, yesterday after we came in for drill, you know, the sort of communication that you shared around the new direction that we're going with in the watch really blew me sideways, you know, because I really respect you and I really hold your opinion at high value. So I want, I want to hear your opinion towards me. So help me understand what that was, because I also appreciate I wasn't there, you know, so I, I really want to understand what the nature of that was and, and and how I can get a better interpretation for it. Because honestly, brother, it just blew me away. You know, I was really caught out of left field by that. And yeah. that opens up a trusting conversation yeah. built for me around praise and acknowledgement of how important this individual is and not throwing them aside as some maverick problem child. Exactly that. You've done two things there, Pete, with that example again, is you've used that that firefighter in that example, who's a 15-year firefighter that's probably quite well-respected, has already got a very high level of trust built within that team, and they're ultimately an influencer on that team, on that watch. So if you can win your influencer over, that influencer is now going to speak very kindly and very well of you and help build trust on your behalf for our other team members in the shift. So that is so Because they'll also give you their sign-off. Do you know what I mean? When, yes. when, when you're not there and someone goes, hey, man, fucking Pete says we're doing this fucking thing on Thursday. Yeah, what the fuck is this shit? And you'll go, nah, it's cool. I spoke to him about it this week. I've, I've, I've sort of set him straight and I've put him in line and it's fine. I know what we're doing on Thursday. If that person can perceive it as their idea and say, no, nah, it's all right. I've, I've put him back in his box. And actually, yeah, we are going to do that thing because I've spoke to him about it. And I know I know what the crack is. And they're like, oh, okay, I don't give a fuck if you pretend it's your idea. Great. I want it to be your idea. You tell them yep. it's your sign off. I don't give a fuck because we are going there together yeah. as a team. And I want you to do that because then when yeah. I'm here, you're going to lead in the same way that I'm going to lead. Yeah. It's not like, nah, yeah. Pete thinks we're doing this thing on Thursday, but I'll tell you what, you watch what happens because I'm fucking not showing up for it. Yeah. I'm going to show, I'm going to tell him on Thursday that we've got 27 home fire safety checks. We haven't done. Yeah. I'm going to throw a fucking grenade into Piers plans on Thursday. Don't, don't, don't make that person your enemy. Exactly that. Exactly that. And if you do find yourself in that position where you haven't met your quota for own fire safety visits for whatever reason like one thing you do is self-reflect but go again back on that example there was two things that you you did there for me one was you've used pete as your influencer or whoever your, your your influencer was to help promote that word for you the other thing is you've also recognized that you as the manager you don't need to know everything i've seen so many people go into the role and think that oh now that i've got this position of leadership and management I need to impart on everyone else that I know everything there is to know about the fire service and every single policy there is. You don't. You really don't. Because by doing that, all you do is you close other people down and they will stop thinking for themselves. By using everyone else in a really positive way and asking for their views, their opinions on how to resolve a said situation, or I can't quite remember this thing that it said in our um, in our BA policy. What was it that they said again about BA guidelines? You're mm. you're empowering other people to speak up, mm. you know. So they will develop because you're using them. And I used to do this thing where I went uh, to an Instagram. I, again, I was slated for it by so many people, but I stand by it. Yeah. I used to be the last person off of the fire engine. That's when I was in my managerial leadership role. And the reason I did it is because I had so much trust in my team to get off, to observe what was going on themselves and to equally communicate with me what their thoughts were as to what was going on and what was needed. 
that I was able to go, yeah, I really agree with that, Pete. I think that's really good. Sam, I think that's a really great idea as well. Tim, you know, you've come to me with that. I'm going to help with this problem. I'm going to help with this problem. Mm. So that way I was able to utilize everyone to their full potential and their potential kept growing because they knew it was being used and they wanted to get better. Does that kind of make sense as well? A hundred percent, mate. There's there's literally two yeah. other things that I was thinking about while you were talking there, because I think that's a great example that you see on uh, technical rescue stations is one example, because you get people sometimes come into leadership roles on a standard station with the greatest of respect. And they go, right, I need to get my workplace trainer course, or I need my qualifications in all of these aspects. And I'm like, okay, why do you need to get your BAI qualification and your RTCI? Well, because I need to know that what so-and-so is teaching on the watch is the correct thing. Whereas you're never going to have all the answers as a leader. You don't have to have all the answers. You have to have trust in people to know the answers for themselves. Because I use the technical rescue station as an example. They will have a rope specialist on the watch. They will have a chainsaw specialist. They'll have a shoring specialist. Mm. They'll have an animal rescue specialist. They'll have a water rescue specialist. Yeah, The watch manager or watch commander or sub officer is not going to have all the fucking answers. They don't need to because actually... James is the water reference. Yeah, James is the water instructor. So on the day we're going to do water training, James is going to plan it. James is going to lead it. Yeah. And when I go to water incident, I am going to solicit James's opinion because James is the expert in the room. And even when people come to you about things like, you know, oh, I've got a really good idea for home safety. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Listen, 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 listen. I'll tell you what, go and talk to James about that because James runs the reference for community safety. Okay. Run that idea by him and see what he thinks about it. Cause I know he's got a good tactical plan in place at the minute. I know he's got a bit of a layout for the next three months. And what you've just said to me that I think is really going to add value, but I trust him to manage that because that's what he's there doing. He's doing a great job of it. So if you can go and give that feedback to him and then hundred percent, I'll back you behind it. I'm sure if it fits into the model, you know, James will come and come and have a chat to me about it. Don't micromanage and just go, oh, you know, they don't want that person walking away going, Hey James, I know you run the uh, community safety reference, but Pete said, that we're doing this tomorrow because I told him about my idea and he says we're going to do it. You're like, well, what the fuck am I doing then? I've already fucking done a plan for the next four weeks. Do you know what I mean? Fuck it. You know what? I won't plan anything at all because he's clearly just going to yeah. micromanage it himself. And this um, shines light. Have you read um, Turn the Ship Around by David Marquette? Yes. Yes. Turn the Ship Amazing Around is a great yeah. one because he prepared for this you know, he was going to be working on, I think it was the USS Santa Fe, a nuclear powered submarine. Um, but he'd completely prepared for leading a different yep. ship. He'd spent something like two years when they get given a post in, they get years to prepare for it or like eight months or a year or something like that. And he'd learn everything, all the procedures, all the models, all the layout of the ship, everything about it. And then like a month or two before it, he was told he'd be going to the Santa Fe instead. And he didn't know anything about it. So what he was effectively looking at is, he would have to go in there and truly trust the individuals around him because he needed their information. He didn't know all the answers himself and he needed them to be able to assess the situation and come up with a plan. And then they would have to demonstrate that rationale to him. And I think his stock response was, um, you know, I, I approve that or something like that. It was basically get it done. Do you know what I mean? And it, it leans into what you were saying there, letting firefighters go and get situational awareness about the incident come back to you and say right james yeah i've been around the rear side of the building i can see a window open on the second floor i've checked the kitchen door the kitchen looks like it's open but actually the kitchen window is smashed so it's actually ventilated from the back so i can see the wind is on our front so actually it's probably best that we would go in the front door as you originally planned to do because even though it's ventilated from the back the wind is with us if that makes sense and you go yeah right i totally agree we're going to enter from the front you are not, they've, they've articulated that plan from their understanding, their situational awareness. You're just agreeing with them. Well, you might go, okay, so what do you think we should do? And they go, well, I don't know, boss, you know, just that's the information I've seen. Okay, but what do you think we should do? Oh, I, th I think we should go through the front, to be honest with you. Yeah, roger that. We're going in through the front. Do you know what I mean? Or actually, the window is broken behind and the wind is against us. So as soon as we open this front door, bang, it's going to hit us. And the, the, the lads might be sort of sat there in that, you know, massive heat flow coming through that 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 sort of heat path coming through there. So my, I'm thinking maybe we can recommit around the back. Okay, what's the best route around the back? Great. I like your rationale. Right, guys, don't set up there. Engine control is going to go to the left of the building. We're going to send two BA around the back. What I want is a covering jet 
out the front in case any of these windows fail as well. And that allows that person to come up with their own tactical plan. And I know I've waffled there for a couple of minutes, but all of this is done within 30 seconds whilst you're getting your own situational awareness to speak into the occupier. All of these pieces, you haven't got to come up with the whole plan yourself. Do you know what I mean? You're the one that takes responsibility, but you haven't got to take the credit and you haven't got to come up with every decision yourself. Yeah, no, you're, you're bang on with what you're saying. I know that book, David Marquette, and and you articulated it so nicely because it, what he was looking to do is he, he went onto this uh, submarine and it was a parent-child situation. So the, hmm. the staff on there would tell him what the problem was. You know, so it'd be, uh, boss, we're taking on uh, water at the front end of our sub or something like that. And they would just tell him the problem, waiting for him to come up with the solution for everything that existed. And all he did is he flipped it around and said, that's great. You've told me what the problem is. What is your intention? And they that would go, it. well, I would. That was my it, intention yeah. is that we need to, you know, we need to block that front end of the submarine up and we need to take us up to the surface. Great. I agree with it. Let's do it. And yeah, it was a that was it, wasn't it? What was your parent yeah, that child. was the wording there? What's your intentions? Perfect. Exactly that. It was parent child to adult, adult, wasn't it? And all of a sudden, he had three hundred adults working on that ship, rather than one adult and him having to manage two hundred ninety nine children in in that kind of term, if you like. That's a great thing, mate. And that connection there, because we always moan, treat them like children; they like like children. Yeah, treat them like an adult; they will grow into that space exactly that this is how we're going to change culture is by having adult adult conversations creating safe spaces for us to have conversations teaching uh, uh giving development opportunity on how we can become better leaders we need more leaders uh, and effective leaders in the organization that are true to their values that are true to the diversity and they're authentic um so that we can help change the culture in our organization. I truly believe that. I really do. Dude, I absolutely love that. I've absolutely loved that conversation. We've been talking for, I think, two and a half hours straight. <laughs> something ridiculous like that. I it's know. Something great. It has, it's, it's, but it's been so good. And I could keep going. I really could. Mate, I, I know, this. 100%. <laughs> we could just keep high-fiving ourselves all the way down to the bus. But... um. We've covered such a massive landscape, mate. And what I always feel when we're ending these conversations is I don't want people to feel like they've had a lovely warm bath and they've forgotten some of the applicable things they can take away and do. So we've got a bunch of notes there. We're going to put in a link to your LinkedIn, a link to your website, Leaders Eat Last Time and Cynic, the public speaking with Julian Treasure, Richard Stokes. We spoke a little bit around Turn the Ship Around. There's a free downloadable toolkit from yourself. But what I suppose I'm asking from you now is, to force you into that corner of an elevator pitch that if uh, people said, you know, what, what am I going to get away from listening to the episode that you did on the podcast? What would be that summary points that we could give people to help them develop into better leadership? There's a few aspects to this. The first thing is around self-reflection on where you are as a leader at the moment. And Look at people you admire around you and take some of the positive leadership traits that they are displaying. Look at yourself. Are you displaying similar leadership traits? Are you being the best version of yourself? Ultimately, ask yourself, are you being the leader that you wish you always had? So look at your leadership traits. The other thing is have some confidence in having difficult conversations with people. But when you do it, be authentic and do it from a position of care and kindness and wanting to help the other person. So we talked about my pub is r and r model. And again, I'll add a link uh, to this podcast. Well, I'll get Pete, you, you to add a link to this yeah, podcast absolutely. on on my pub is r and r model. And I'll, I'll produce a toolkit for it so that you can start using that in your workplace now to help you build your confidence in having these conversations and it will help you build trust with your team members. Another thing that we could, should take away from this is the importance of psychological safety in our workplace, not shutting down conversations and shaming people when something goes wrong or something wrong has been said. Have that difficult conversation, but have it in a supportive way uh, so that people feel comfortable enough to discuss it with us. With psychological safety, we know that when that exists in a workplace, people are way more likely 
to speak up, be open and honest, be more creative in the way they do things. They're more likely to help other people out. They're less likely to speak ill of others too. And on the and as a direct result of that, it will improve team effectiveness and response. So there they are, my three kind of key take home messages from this. Psychological safety, look at yourself with your leadership game and how you support other people um, and how to have a difficult conversation that yields trust and gets a better result off the back of it. Do some of these things and you're already on your way to improving the culture within whichever organization you're in right now. Dude, I've absolutely loved that conversation. Thank you so, so much for your time today. I'm so glad that we got to make this connection. My sincere hope is that we will have lots of adventures together in the future. Hope, empower, sorry, help empower and guide people on the way that they're doing their journeys. Hopefully have some cool adventures together. I'm sure there's some work we could do together, doing some kind of stuff to help talk to people, as, as Julian would probably say, speak so that other people want to hear. You know, because you speak with such an authentic, Definitely. relatable manner, which I think people can connect with. Because sometimes you see some of these performance coaches and senior leadership members speaking in such a perfect, untarnished and inaccessible way. The 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 terminology that they use, their vernacular, actually creates a barrier between them and other people. And the fact that you've got such an authentic background. And you've gone away and worked on yourself to now try and make a positive change in the organizations that you work with is something that's incredibly rare. So I really want to thank you for your trust and your honesty and sort of your, I want to say vulnerability, you know, as we've had this conversation over the last couple of hours. So I'm really excited about the future with this. I'm really excited to do some more work together in the future as well. And I really want to thank you for your time. No, Pete, that goes both ways. It's, it is really really wonderful to connect with you I've, I've obviously listened to some of your podcasts in the past uh, and i've enjoyed enjoyed the ones that i've listened to um meeting you today on a one-to-one -one and and talking it feels like this wasn't a podcast this was a talk between two friends that share very similar values and that's the secret about the podcast for me it's actually the Pete Wakefield College yeah. of Development. I get to speak to so many incredible people <laughs> and I just try and take people along with me because you'll have done it so many times yourself. You have a conversation with a fascinating person. You're like, oh God, I wish I could listen back to that because James said some amazing things that I'd really benefit from taking notes on, but I'll forget so much of it. And you, you also end up thinking, I can't be the only person that finds James fascinating. I wish other people could have been there when I spoke to him. And something like the podcast can then act like that audible time capsule that we bury in the internet for people to access now in the future and hopefully for generations of firefighters to come. Yeah, I agree, mate. I agree. Mate, it's been wonderful. I really, really enjoyed this morning. It's definitely been the most enjoyable podcast I think I've ever done, to be honest. Ah, you liar. It, it feels, <laughs> it, You'll do your own podcast one day and it will smoke the hell out of this one because I fumble my way through it. <laughs> oh, mate, you've got to be a comedian. You've got to adapt. You've got to adapt every week to the different guests that you've got coming on, haven't you? And well, that's you know, without us getting back into the leadership model, that is a thing as well, isn't it? You've got to be able to build rapport with every single individual. And it's not about being two faced, it's about being the yes. chameleon relating to your audience knowing your audience yes. taking the feedback the visual the audible am i landing is this coming across adapt yeah. people go oh that's manipulation no it's not you're adapting to your audience okay wear different yeah. hats flex your leadership style everyone's got a tickle spot mate but everyone's tickle spots in a different place <laughs> everyone's tickle spots we get into a different conversation here that's a whole different thing we'll do that on the one-to-one -one when we see each other no, well I'll yeah <laughs> when i mean if you want if you want to get someone to do something for you you want you you're looking at your end result Oh, Everyone's yeah. got a different tickle spot. So you just kind of need to know how to, how to tickle them in the right way to, to get the best out of them. That's what it, that's what I mean by that. <laughs> Love it, mate. Well, if people are still listening now, then this conversation has certainly tickled their pickle. So hopefully they'll be able to listen back to it and take something from it. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time today, mate. Definitely. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Yeah, likewise, Pete. Take care.
The Firefighters Podcast was created to recognize, acknowledge, inspire, and hopefully even motivate these incredible individuals who have chosen to be part of the first responder community. Our driving purpose is to create a legacy resource for the current and future generations of firefighters and first responders. We get some incredible feedback from listeners and guests. And as the podcast grows, our desire to create longevity and sustainability means that we are asking for the support of our listeners. If you want to support the podcast, if you want to get discounts to our merchandise, hoodies, clothing, coins, patches, talent, and also access to all of the incredible documents get shared with us from our podcast guests and sector leaders. And please head over to our Patreon page and for just £3 a month, you can support the future of the podcast. Please finally hit that follow, subscribe or rate button on the platform you're listening. And wherever you are in the world, please support your emergency services responders. And thank you for listening.